what still divides us, a Protestant and Roman Catholic debate. And we are thrilled that there are so many of you here tonight for this very important debate, and we are thrilled that we've had such a tremendous response, especially from so many of you who are from out of state. I want to say a word briefly about why we are having this debate. In the past year, as many of you know, there's been quite a bit of discussion about evangelicals and Roman Catholics coming together and sharing a common mission. Here has felt all along that unity is indeed something to be sought after, but unity can never come at the cost of truth. It was clear that the two key theological issues of the Protestant Reformation, the questions of authority and justification, were being lost in the midst of this pell-mell rush for unity. This debate, then, is a response to that lack. Our hope is that by beginning a serious dialogue on these two primary principles of the Reformation, that we can improve this current situation. It would be tragic if we abandoned our heritage, both as Protestants and as Catholics, and embraced a unity which is not founded upon the Word of God. And so that is a nutshell about the history of the larger debate that has, to a degree, spawned this one. So without further ado and announcements, I want to introduce to you tonight the panelists for tonight's debate. And I'll begin with those who will be representing and defending the Roman Catholic positions. And I'd like, I know this is difficult with the tables, but I'd like each of you to stand as I mention your names so people will know who you are. First is Patrick Madrid. Patrick is Vice President of Catholic Answers, a lay-run Catholic apologetics and evangelization organization based in San Diego, California, and is contributing editor of This Rock magazine. He is currently completing a Master's of Theology at the University of Dallas. Patrick is a veteran of radio, television, and live debates with non-Catholic spokesmen, and he is also the editor of a new book, Surprised by Truth. <coughs> William Marshner is professor of theology at Christendom College in Front Royal, Virginia. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Gettysburg College, and after studying Old Testament languages at Yale Graduate School, he was received into the Roman Catholic Church in 1967 and wrote for Triumph magazine. He received his Master of Arts degree from the University of Dallas and the Licentiate in Sacred Theology from the Lateran University in Rome. Robert Genis converted to Roman Catholicism in 1992 and is the president of Catholic Apologetics International, an organization dedicated to teaching and defending the Roman Catholic faith. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from George Washington University and a Master of Arts in Religion from Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. He contributed to the book Surprised by Truth and the recently published Shockwave 2000. And representing the Protestant position, Michael Horton is president of Christians United for Reformation based in Anaheim, the author and editor of many books. Michael attended Biola University, Westminster Theological Seminary, where he received his Master of Arts in Religion, and he is at present a candidate for the Ph.D. in Historical Theology at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. Mike lectures widely and is recently appointed as visiting professor of systematic theology at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando. Robert Godfrey is president and professor of church history at Westminster Theological Seminary in California. He received his bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. degrees from Stanford University and his master of divinity degree from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. In addition to editing the Westminster Theological Journal for many years, he co-edited and contributed to Through Christ's Church and Theonomy, a Reform Critique. Rod Rosenblatt, Lutheran scholar and lecturer, is professor of theology and apologetics at Concordia College, Irvine. Rod received his Master of Arts in Philosophy of Religion from the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and his Ph.D. from the University of Strasbourg. He contributed chapters to the Agony of Deceit and Christianity for the Tough-Minded, and he is at present developing a theological database. Now, probably one of the most significant people tonight is our moderator. And I want to take a moment and introduce him to you before we turn the evening over to Tim. Dr. Tim Jackson is professor of ethics in the Religious Studies Department at Stanford University. He's a graduate of Princeton, received his Ph.D. from Yale, and is the author of numerous scholarly articles. And he's just completed a book entitled Love, Love's Priority, is that the correct title? Love's Priority, 
and that is a defense of Christian charity as a primary consideration in the field of ethics. And we're grateful for that because we expect his expertise in charity to come in handy while he moderates this debate. <laughs> and so, without any further ado and announcements, it's time to begin the debate. And here to begin things and tell us a little bit more about tonight's format is Dr. Tim Jackson. Tim. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. I, myself being an Episcopalian, seem appropriate to moderate this Roman Catholic <laughs> and Protestant debate. I subscribe to the Via Media and I will simply sit back and watch. Um, but the topic for tonight is Sola Scriptura, the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. The format is going to be as follows. There'll be two opening statements, each of 40 minutes. The Protestants will go first tonight, but tomorrow the Roman Catholics will have first shot. Robert Godfrey will lead off. Again, each will have 40 minutes. At the end of that, at the end of 80 minutes, there'll be a break, 15 minutes. There'll be coffee, I think, back in the foyer. We'll also ask you to write questions during that break, written questions to be submitted to folks who will then in turn bring them up to us. After the break of 15 minutes, there'll be cross-examinations. These will be 10 minutes each, Roman Catholic, Protestant, then rebuttals of 10 minutes each. After that, there'll be an open forum of about 45 minutes where you'll have the chance to have questions raised. I may raise a few questions myself. At the end of that, there'll be about 10 minutes, five minutes each for wrap-up. Let me reiterate Kim's point that we really would ask you not to applaud, except at the end, if that seems appropriate. Not a lot of audible noise for the sake of civility and for the sake of the tapes. But without further ado, then, let me introduce the opening statement from the Protestant side to be given by Robert Godfrey. Thank you very much. I'm very privileged to be here tonight. I would like to correct only one thing that uh, uh, Tim Riddlebarger said in his opening remarks, and that is, I hope you don't have a good time here tonight. Uh, this is not uh, a gathering for fun and games. Uh, this is a most uh, serious and solemn occasion as we consider uh, profound issues of spiritual reality. And I hope you'll work hard tonight. I hope you'll listen attentively tonight. And I hope that, above all else, you'll seek God's truth tonight. Our meeting is entitled, What Still Divides Us? And in the two days that we have together, we'll look at two of the issues that continue to divide Protestant Catholics from Roman Catholics. Now, I speak that way uh, deliberately because both sides in this debate claim to be Catholic, that is, to be part of the ancient apostolic universal church of Jesus Christ. Our Roman opponents will tell you that we Protestants departed from the Catholic faith in the 16th century. We would suggest that they departed from it earlier. And that's part of the debate that we need to have tonight. We as Protestants maintain that the scripture alone is our authority in matters of religious truth. Our distinguished Roman opponents will maintain that scripture is insufficient as the authority of the people of God in religion and that tradition and the teaching authority of the church must be added to the scripture. This is a very solemn matter to debate. It is no time for games or for fancy debating tricks. We must be searching for the truth. God has declared that whoever adds to or takes away from his word is subject to his curse. The Roman church has declared at the Council of Trent that we as Protestants are accursed for taking away from the word of God sacred tradition. We as Protestants have declared that the Roman Church is a false church for having added human tradition to the Word of God. And that very basic issue and subject, then, is what is before us tonight. Many sincere apologists over 500 years nearly have debated this difference, and the differences remain basically as they were in the 16th century. Not much new will be said here tonight but we do need together to continue to pursue the truth. 
In spite of the difficulty of the undertaking then this evening, I am eager to join the historic train of Protestant apologists to defend the doctrine that Scripture alone is our ultimate religious authority. I believe that I can show that this position is the clear position of the Scripture itself. And I hope that by the grace of God, those committed to the Roman doctrine of tradition will come to see the tragic error of denigrating the sufficiency and clarity of God's own inspired word. Let me begin with certain clarifications. I am not arguing tonight that all truth is to be found in the Bible, or that the Bible is the only form in which the truth of God has come to his people. I am not arguing that every verse of the Bible is clear to every reader. I am not arguing that the church, both as the people of God and as ministerial office, is not a great value and help in understanding the Scripture. As William Whitaker, in his notable work, A Disputation on Holy Scripture, wrote in the late 16th century as a Protestant, For we also say that the church is the interpreter of Scripture, and that the gift of interpretation resides only in the church. But we deny that it pertains to particular persons, or is tied to any particular see or succession of men. I will argue the Protestant doctrine that all things necessary for salvation concerning faith and life are taught in the Bible clearly enough for the ordinary believer to find it there. The position I am defending is certainly what is taught in the Bible itself, and we can look at any number of texts that indicate that in the Scripture. I'd like to begin tonight with a look at Deuteronomy 31 and 32. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, you might want to turn there. Uh, Moses, in writing Deuteronomy, is speaking at the end of his life, and he is uh, uh, preparing the people of Israel for their future. And in verse 9 of chapter 31 of Deuteronomy, uh, we read that Moses wrote down the law of God. And then in verse 12, that he ordered that it should be read to the people so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of of this law. So the law is written, and Moses has it read to the people so that they might learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. And then in Deuteronomy 32, at verses 46 and 47, speaking of this same law, Moses declared to all Israel, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you, they are your life. Notice the clear elements in this passage. One, the word Moses is talking about is a written word. Two, the people can and must listen to it and learn it. In this word, they can find life, Moses says. The people do not need any additional traditions to guide them to life. They do not need any infallible institution to interpret the word. The priests, prophets, and scribes of Israel certainly function to help the people ministerially. But the word alone was sufficient for salvation. The prophets, who were indeed inspired by the Spirit of God, came very much with the attitude of Micah, who said, He has showed you, O man, what is good. The function of the priests and prophets was not to add to or even to clarify the law. Rather, they applied the law to the people who were sinfully indifferent to it. The law was sufficient in itself as the life of Israel. If this sufficiency and clarity of the word is true in the Old Testament, we can assume that it is all the more true in the New. The New Testament gloriously fulfills what the Old Testament promises. But we do not have to assume it. Rather, the New Testament makes clear that the character of Scripture is to be sufficient and clear. One example of that is found in 2 Timothy 3. There, Paul is writing to his younger brother in the faith, Timothy, he writes that Timothy, who was instructed in the faith by his grandmother and mother, has also learned all about Paul's teaching. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. Timothy had been mightily helped by all sorts of oral teaching, some of it apostolic. 
Yet Paul writes words to Timothy directing him to Scripture. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and let me read those words beginning chapter 3, verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to lead a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. You see, Paul reminds Timothy that the scriptures, the scriptures are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The scriptures are able to make him wise unto salvation in Jesus Christ. And the scriptures have the character then to thoroughly prepare the man of God for every, every good work. So Paul tells Timothy that, must, that he must preach this word, this inscripturated word, even though the time is coming when people will not want to hear it, but rather will want teachers to suit their own fancy who will instruct them in myths rather than in the truth of the word. The force and clarity of the apostles' teaching here is striking. In spite of the rich oral teaching Timothy had received, he is to preach the scriptures because those scriptures give him clearly all that he needs for wisdom and preparation to instruct the people of faith in the people of God in faith and in every good work. The scripture makes him wise for salvation and equips him with everything he needs for doing every good work required of the preacher of God. The sufficiency and clarity of the word are taught in this one section of scripture over and over again. St. John Chrysostom correctly paraphrased the meaning of this text when he said, Paul says to Timothy, you have scripture for a master instead of me. From there you can learn whatever you would know. Now I've listened to several tapes of our opponents in debates on this topic. Often Protestant apologists have cited 2 Timothy 3 against them. Their usual response seems to be just repeated assertions that 2 Timothy 3 does not teach the sufficiency of Scripture. Sometimes they refer to other texts as proposed parallel texts, James 1.4, Colossians 1.28, Colossians 4.12, Matthew 19.21, saying that such parallel passages show that thorough, thoroughly equipped, doesn't really mean thorough or complete or sufficient. But in those Supposedly parallel passages, the same Greek word is not used as what is found in here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Such citations are not parallel and do not help to clarify the meaning of 2 Timothy 3. I hope that tonight they will not just assert that 2 Timothy 3 and other passages do not say what we claim they do. Repeated assertions do not prove a point. That is only a propaganda technique. We need to have our texts and the explanations we offered examined in a responsible and thorough way. The confidence that Paul had in the scriptures and which he taught Timothy was clearly understood by the great church father Augustine in his treatise to prepare leaders of the church in an understanding of the Bible, his treatise on Christian doctrine. Augustine wrote, Among those things which are said openly in scripture are to be found all those teachings which involve faith, the mores of living, and that hope and charity which we have discussed. Augustine felt that the scripture did indeed contain all that was needed for faith and love and that it was taught openly there. 
We should not be surprised that the Apostle Paul, the Old Testament, and the greatest teacher of the ancient church held the sufficiency and perspicuity of the Scripture. That is the position that Jesus took in one of the most important moments of his life. At the beginning of his public ministry, Jesus faced the focused temptation of the devil in the wilderness. He faced the temptation as the Son of God, but also as the second Adam and the true Israel. And how did he face that temptation? He did not appeal to the oral tradition of Israel. He did not appeal to the authority of the rabbis or the Sanhedrin. He did not even appeal to his own divinity or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Our Savior, in the face of temptation, turned again and again and again to the Scriptures. It is written, it is written, it is written, he said. The Scriptures made him wise for salvation. The Scriptures equipped him for every good work. They were clear, as he implied that even the evil one knew. When the devil tried to quote Scripture, Jesus did not turn to some other authority. Rather, Jesus said, it is also written. When the evil one or his representatives misuse the Bible or imply that it is unclear, Jesus teaches us that we must look more deeply into the word, not away from it. Now, my distinguished opponents will soon have an opportunity to try to convince you that these texts of Scripture do not mean what they clearly say. Let me anticipate some of their arguments and prepare you for some of the ways they tend to respond. First, they will try to say that the phrase, the word of God, can mean more than just the Bible. I've already granted that. The question before us is whether today anything other than the scriptures are necessary for us to know the truth of God for salvation. The scriptural texts I have cited show that nothing else is needed. Our opponents need to show not that Paul referred to his preaching as well as his writing as the word of God. We grant that. They need to show that Paul taught that the oral teaching of the apostles would be needed to supplement the scriptures for the church through the ages. They cannot show that because Paul did not teach it, and neither do the scriptures as a whole. Second, notice that our opponents, while making much of tradition, will never really define tradition or tell you what its content is. Now, tradition is a word that can be used in a variety of ways. It can refer to a certain school of understanding of the scriptures, such as the Lutheran tradition. Or it can refer to traditions supposedly from the apostles that are not in the Bible. It can refer to developing traditions in the history of the church that are clearly not ancient in origin. Usually, in the ancient fathers of the church, the word tradition refers to the standard interpretation of the Bible among them. And we as Protestants value such tradition. Now, what do Roman apologists mean when they assert the authority of tradition? Historically, they have not agreed among themselves about the nature and content of tradition. Mr. Madrid, for example, has said that tradition does not add anything to Scripture, that everything is to be found explicitly or implicitly in Scripture. But almost all Roman apologists for over 300 years after the Council of Trent argued that tradition does add to the Scriptures. Some Roman apologists believe that all binding tradition was taught by the apostles, but others believe that tradition evolves and develops through the centuries of the church so that there are traditions necessary for salvation that were never known to the apostles. It is impossible to know what the real Roman position is on this matter. The Second Vatican Council expressed itself with deliberate ambiguity. It stated, this tradition, which comes from the apostles, develops in the church with the help of the Holy Spirit, for there is a growth in the understanding of the realities and the words which have been handed down. For as the centuries succeed one another, the church constantly moves forward toward the fullness of divine truth until the words of God reach their complete fulfillment in her. Now tell me, what does that mean? Does it mean tradition was all there in the apostles or in the scripture or that it is added to in some way or develops into something new and unknown in later times? All those different positions have been argued by different Roman apologists. And the question remains for us, what is the real clear meaning and content of Roman tradition? Rome usually tries to clarify its position by saying that its authority really is scripture, tradition and church together. Again, Vatican II. It is clear, therefore, that sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the teaching of authority of the church in accord with God's most wise design are so linked and joined together that one cannot stand without the others. 
and that all together and each in its own way under the action of the Holy Spirit contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. In fact, however, if you listen carefully, you will notice that the real authority of our Roman Catholic opponents is neither scripture nor tradition, but the church. What is the scripture and what does it teach? Only the church can tell you. What is tradition and what does it teach? Only the church can tell you. As the Roman theologian John Eck in the 16th century said, the scriptures are not authentic except by the authority of the church. As Pope Pius IX said at the time of the First Vatican Council in 1870, I am tradition. The amazing arrogance of such a statement is staggering, but it confirms our claim that for Rome the only real authority is the church and ultimately only the pope. Now, Protestantism arose in the 16th century in reaction to such claims and teachings of the Roman church. In the Middle Ages, most within the church had believed that the Bible and the tradition of the church taught the same or at least complementary doctrines. But as Luther and others studied the Bible with a greater care and depth than the church had done in centuries, they began to discover that tradition and the Bible contradicted each other. They discovered, for example, the Bible teaches that all have sinned except Jesus. Romans 3, 10 through 12, Hebrews 4, verse 15. But tradition says that Mary was sinless. The Bible teaches that Christ offered his sacrifice on the cross once for all. Hebrews 7, 27, 9, 28, 10, 10. But tradition says that the priest sacrifices Christ on the altar at Mass. The Bible says that we are not to bow down to statues. Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. But tradition says that we should bow down to statues. Not ancient tradition, but medieval tradition. The Bible says that all Christians are saints and priests. Ephesians 1, 1. 1 Peter 2.9, but tradition says that saints and priests are special castes within the Christian community. The Bible says that Jesus is the only mediator between man and God, 1 Timothy 2.5, but tradition says that Mary is co-mediator with Christ. The Bible says that all Christians should know that they have eternal life, 1 John 5.13, but tradition says that all Christians cannot and should not know that they have eternal life. The reformers saw that the words of Jesus to the Pharisees applied equally to their own day and to our day when he said to them, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, Matthew 15, 6. The reformers also discovered that tradition contradicted tradition. For example, the tradition of the Roman church teaches that the pope is the head of the church, a bishop over all bishops. But Gregory the Great pope and saint at the end of the ancient church period said that such a teaching came from the spirit of Antichrist. He wrote, I confidently affirm that whoever calls himself universal bishop or desires to be so called by others is in his pride a forerunner of Antichrist. So which is it? Which tradition do you follow? Saint Pope Gregory the Great or later Roman tradition? More directly related to our debate is the evident tension in tradition about the value of reading the Bible. The Index of Forbidden Books of Pope Pius IV in 1559 said, Since experience teaches that if the reading of the Holy Bible in the vernacular is permitted generally without discrimination, more damage than advantage will result because of the boldness of men, the judgment of bishops and inquisitors is to serve as guide in this regard. Bishops and inquisitors may, in accord with the counsel of the local priest and confessor, allow Catholic tradition translations of the Bible to be read by those of whom they realize that such reading will not lead to detriment, but to the increase of faith and piety. This permission is to be given in writing. Whoever reads or has such a translation in his possession without this permission cannot be absolved from his sins until he has turned in these Bibles. Clearly, the reading of Scripture is regarded as dangerous in the 16th century. But in marked contrast, Vatican II stated, easy access to sacred Scripture should be provided for all the Christian faithful since the Word of God should be available at all times. The Church with maternal care concern sees to it that suitable and correct translations are made into uh, different languages, especially from the original texts of the sacred books. Does tradition then believe that the Bible is dangerous or helpful? 
The Bible did prove dangerous in the 16th century. Most who read it carefully became Protestants. Such discoveries, you see, led the Protestants back to the Bible. There they learned that the scripture must stand as judge of all teaching. The scripture teaches that it is the revelation of God and therefore true in all that it teaches, but nowhere does the scripture say that the church is true in all that it says. Rather, although the church as a whole will be preserved in the faith, the scripture warns us that wolves will arrive within the very church itself, Acts 20, verse 29 and 30, and even that the man of lawlessness will sit in the heart of the church teaching lies, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. This brings us to our third concern about the arguments our opponents may make. They will use the word church repeatedly. Especially those of us who are Protestants will usually be inclined to interpret their use of the word as referring to the body of the faithful. But that is not the way they will characteristically use the word. When they refer to the authority of the church, they mean the infallible teaching authority of councils and popes. That view of the church they take from the Middle Ages and in a romantic way, read back into the ancient church period. So notice very carefully how they use the word church. And remember that neither the scriptures nor the great majority of the fathers of the ancient church period understood, understand and understood the authority of the church in the way that they do. Let me offer as an illustration two examples from the work of the great church father Augustine, often quoted against us Protestants on the question of the authority of the church. At one point in his debate with the Pelagians, a bishop of Rome sided with Augustine, and Augustine declared, Rome has spoken, the matter is settled. Apparently a very clear statement. Later, however, another pope opposed Augustine on this same subject, and Augustine responded by saying, Christ has spoken, the matter is settled. Sounds like a Protestant. Augustine did not bow to the authority of the Bishop of Rome, but turned to the word of Christ to evaluate the teaching of Rome. Another statement of Augustine, often cited by Roman apologists from the Middle Ages down till today, reads, I would not have believed had not the authority of the Catholic Church moved me. Again, an apparently very strong and clear statement. But in another place, Augustine wrote, I would never have understood Plotinus had not the authority of my Neoplatonic teachers moved me. Now, Augustine was not teaching the absolute authority or infallibility of Neoplatonic teachers. Rather, this parallel shows that Augustine is not talking about some absolute infallible authority in the church, but is talking about the ministerial work of the church and about teachers who help students understand. That authority of the church we freely grant. Let us look at the church further by raising a related issue the issue of the canon of Scripture. Our opponents will probably try to make much of the issue of the canon. They will tell you that the Bible alone cannot be our authority because the Bible does not tell us what books are in the Bible. They will tell you that the Bible alone cannot be our authority and that the church must tell us as authority what books are in the Bible. When they say the church tells us, they mean popes and councils must tell us. This implies that we did not have a Bible until Pope Damasus offered a list of the canon in 382, or perhaps until 1546 when the Council of Trent became the first ecumenical council to define the canon. But of course the people of God had the Bible before 1546 and before 382. In the first place, the church always had scripture. The apostolic preaching and teaching, the apostolic writing of the first century repeatedly verified its teaching by quoting the Old Testament. Though quotations from and allusions to the Old Testament abound in the New, the New Testament does not reject the Old, but fulfills it, and so the Church always had a canonical foundation in the Old Testament. In the second place, we can see that the Apostles sensed that the New Covenant, inaugurated by our Lord Jesus Christ, would have a new or augmented canon. Canon and covenant are interrelated and interdependent ideas in the Bible. Peter testifies to this emerging canon when he includes the letters of Paul as part of the scriptures, 2 Peter 3.16. In the third place, we must see that the canon of scripture is in a real sense established by the scripture itself because the canonical books are self-authenticating. As God's revelation, they are recognized by the people of God as God's own word. This is very much in line with what Jesus said. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They will listen to my voice. John 10 verses 14 and 16. In the deepest sense, we cannot judge the word. 
but the word judges us. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of hearts. The self-authenticating character of the canon is demonstrated by the remarkable unanimity reached by the people of God on the canon. In the fourth place, we must see that historically the canon was formed not by the actions of popes and councils. These actions simply recognized the emerging consensus of the people of God as they recognized the authentic scriptures. Indeed, whatever criteria were used by popes and councils to recognize the canon, be it authorship, style, content, witness of the Holy Spirit, or whatever, these same criteria were available to the people of God as a whole. We can see this basic understanding of the formation of the canon stated in the New Catholic Encyclopedia, Roman Catholic, not Protestant Catholic, which states, quote, the canon already implicitly present in the apostolic age gradually became explicit through a number of providential factors forming and fixing it. We can also see this same basic approach to the canon reflected again in the words of Augustine, writing in his treatise on Christian doctrine. Writing after the so-called Council of Hippo formulated the canon, writing after Pope Damasus supposedly issued the canon of Scripture authoritatively, Augustine, in addressing the issue of canonicity in uh, chapter 2, section 8 of his On Christian Doctrine, declared that if a student of Scripture wonders about the canon, he said, quote, in the matter of canonical Scriptures, he should follow the authority of the greater number of Catholic churches. He will observe this rule concerning canonical scriptures that he will prefer those accepted by all Catholic churches to those which some do not accept among those which are not accepted by the largest number of important churches to those held by a few minor churches of less authority. You notice what Augustine is saying here. He is not looking to the Bishop of Rome as authoritative. He is not looking to any particular council, even the council in his own church as authoritative. He's saying that one must look to the emerging consensus among the churches who follow the scriptures and hold to the truth. Like Augustine, we do, we do not disparage the value of the witness of the people of God to the canon in the ancient church. We value the ministry of the church in this, as in all things. But we deny that the church in its offices or councils authoritatively establishes the the scripture on the basis of some knowledge or power not available to Christians generally. The character of the canonical books draws the people of God to them. Now another matter that is at issue between us and our distinguished opponents is the matter of unity. They will suggest that we as Protestants disprove our claim of the clarity of Scripture by our failure to agree about the meaning of Scripture as Protestants. We recognize that Protestants are divided into many denominations, and we recognize that this is tragic. But all Protestants who are heirs of the Reformation are united in understanding the gospel and in respecting one another as brothers in Christ. We have all found the same gospel clearly in the scriptures. When we discuss unity and authority tonight, let us be certain that we are making fair and accurate comparisons. Our opponents will want to compare Roman theory with Protestant practice. That is not fair. We must compare theory with theory or practice with practice. In neither case, in practice, Does either group have the agreement internally it would like? Remember that while Rome is united organizationally, it is just as divided theologically as is Protestantism, broadly understood. The institution of an infallible pope has not created theological unity in the Roman church. Rather, Roman theologians are constantly disagreeing with each other as to what the popes have taught and as to whether those teachings are in fact proclaimed ex cathedra and are therefore infallible. The modern state of the Roman Church really has shown that the institution of the papacy has not made clear the necessary content of Roman Catholic truth. I suspect that every honest member of the Roman Church here in our audience tonight will have to acknowledge that. 
As early as the 17th century, the Reformed theologian Francis Turretin noted the serious theological divisions in the Roman Church and asked why the Pope did not settle these disputes if his office was so effective. Such theological problems are certainly much greater today than in Turton's day, and the, answer, the question remains unanswered. Why is the Pope so ineffective in bringing clarity and unity to his own church? We should not be surprised that there are divisions in Christ's church. Christ and his apostles predicted that there would be. The Apostle Paul told us that such divisions are useful. He wrote, No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. 1 Corinthians 11:19. Differences should humble us and drive us back to the scriptures to test all claims to truth. If we do not accept the scriptures as our standard and judge, there is indeed no hope for unity. The church must have a standard by which to judge all claims to truth. The church must have the church must have a standard by which to reform and purify itself whenever divisions and conflicts arise. The church cannot claim that it, is that, that it has that standard and truth by simply appealing to itself. Such circular reasoning is not only unconvincing, it is self-defeating. Rome's argument seems to boil down to this. We must believe Rome because Rome says so. The Bible tells us that it is the word of God that will be the light that enables us to walk in God's ways. Listen to the words of Psalm 119, verses 99, 100, 105, and 130. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. Your word is a light to my feet, and a lamp for my path, the unfolding of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. The psalmist is saying here that the light of the word shines so brightly and clearly that if I meditate on it and obey it, I am wiser than any teacher or elder who would disregard the word. The simple can understand it. The word is like a strong flashlight in a dark forest. It enables me to walk on the path without tripping. There is the clarity of God's word to guide us in matters of truth. As I come to the conclusion of these remarks, long for you as listeners, but all too brief properly to discuss the, this crucial subject, we must listen again to the scriptures so that we will act as God's word teaches us to act. Consider the story of Paul in Berea, Acts 17, verses 10 through 12. Paul preached there in the synagogue, and many Jews responded to his preaching with eagerness. We are told that after they listened to Paul each day, they examined the scriptures to see if the things that Paul was saying were true. How did Paul react to this examination of his teaching? Did he say that the scriptures were not clear and that only he, as an apostle, or the rabbis or the Sanhedrin could tell that people what the scriptures actually meant? Or did he say that they should not expect to find the truth in the scriptures alone because they were incomplete and needed to be supplemented by his oral teaching or tradition? Or did he say that they were insulting his apostolic authority and that they should simply submit to him as the infallible interpreter of the Bible? Or did Paul say that they should defer to Peter as the only one who could interpret the Bible? No, he did not say any of these things. Rather, the scripture praises the practice of the Bereans. The Bereans are called noble-minded because they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. They evaluated everything on the basis of the written word of God. If we would be faithful children of God, if we would be noble, we must proceed as the Bereans did, examining the questions that divide us on the basis of the scriptures. We must follow the example of Moses and of Paul and of our Lord Jesus. Do not rest your confidence on the wisdom of men who claim infallibility. 
Rather, stand with the Apostle Paul who wrote 1 Corinthians, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Do not go beyond what is written. I appeal to you, stand with God's word and do not go beyond what is written. Thank you very much. Now to give the second opening statement is Patrick Madrid from the Roman Catholic side. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to begin my formal remarks by thanking Mike Horton and the members of CURE for their gracious invitation to me and to my colleagues Bob and Bill to participate in this very important and I hope very fruitful debate. I am a big fan of discussions such as these where Protestants and Catholics can get at the truth and where we can investigate each other's positions in such a way that we can avoid distortions, misunderstandings, and really see what it is that God has said to his church through his word. Now, a moment ago, I gave some congratulations, I think very well-deserved congratulations, to Bob Godfrey. I think he did a masterful job. Although I must say, in all honesty, there were some inaccuracies and some frankly, some errors in some of the things that he said. There are a little too many of them for me to cover right now, but we do hope to cover them over the course of this evening. And I would ask you to please keep us honest with your note cards asking the tough questions that need to be asked. First of all, let us begin. There are three principal reasons why the teaching, the Protestant theory of Sola Scriptura, is a false teaching and should be rejected by all Christians as a tradition of men. Bob pointed out Matthew 15. I would also point out to you Mark chapter 7, where traditions of men which nullify the word of God are to be condemned and eschewed. I believe Sola Scriptura qualifies as a tradition of men. A, first reason, Sola Scriptura is not historical. And I do hope we have an opportunity to dig into what the early church fathers, in fact, said about the authority of Scripture. B, Sola Scriptura is unbiblical. I'll say it again. Sola Scriptura is not a biblical theory. It does not appear in Scripture. And see, Sola Scriptura is unworkable as a means of guiding the church into all truth. Now, notice that when I said these things, these charges did not contain the implication that we Catholics say that the purpose and role and authority of Scripture is unhistorical or unbiblical or unworkable. In fact, the Catholic Church has always held the canonical Scriptures as its own and held and holds them in the highest esteem and veneration, and has always seen itself bound under Scripture's authority. Now, I was glad that Bob quoted from the Second Vatican Council's document, Dei Verbum. He didn't quote the passage where the Council Fathers say that the magisterium of the Church finds itself not superior to the Word of God, but as its servant. And as Jerome said, ignorance of the sacred Scriptures is ignorant of, ignorance of Christ. That is why we oppose the doctrine of Sola Scriptura, because it obscures what, in fact, often the Scripture is trying to teach us when it becomes subject to private interpretation outside of the bosom of the Church to whom Jesus Christ established and for whom Jesus Christ gave the Scriptures. What we deny, in fact, what the early Church Fathers and Scripture itself denies is the Protestant claim that Scripture was intended by God to function alone as the sole infallible teaching authority for the life of the Church. The early Church Fathers did not teach the idea of Sola Scriptura. Augustine certainly did not teach the idea of Sola Scriptura, as we will demonstrate this evening. They taught, rather, that the Catholic principle of Prima Scriptura, the Latin phrase meaning Scripture first, was the rule we should go by, but never Scripture alone. Catholic theologians term it in the Latin phrase, norma normans, non normata. Loosely translated, that means it is the norm that norms all other norms, but is itself not normed. That is Catholic theology. Vatican II made it clear in its document on divine revelation, as I mentioned, that the church is subject to the authority of scripture, not over it, as my friend Bob wanted to lead you to believe. The church fathers such as Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem, Augustine, and others, 
taught the Catholic view of the material sufficiency of Scripture, which means all the material of doctrine, you might say the stuff of divine revelation, is found at least implicitly in Scripture. It may not be explicit, but it is in some way, however hard it may be to understand that, it is somehow there. Sometimes Protestant apologists attempt to bring forth isolated quotes from the early church fathers. We saw a little bit of that tonight. I'm sure we'll see more. To make it appear as though the church fathers taught sola scriptura. But if we examine all the other things that the church fathers say on this subject, the subject of the authority of scripture and sacred tradition and the magisterium of the church, it becomes immediately clear to all honest readers that they knew nothing of the Protestant doctrine of the Bible alone. Sola Scriptura, second point, is not biblical. There is no verse that can be taken alone, and there are no verses that can be taken in aggregate that will show that Scripture is the only formally sufficient rule of faith for the Church. Now, although the Catholic Church can adduce a lot of evidence from history to refute Sola Scriptura, this issue, the fact that Sola Scriptura is not taught implicitly or explicitly in the Bible, is, you might say, the fatal flaw of the Protestant doctrine of Sola Scriptura. Because if the idea of the Bible alone is itself not found in the pages of Scripture, it is, ipso facto, a self-refuting proposition. The Bible does not claim this for itself. Rather, it points to its own authority working in concert with the Church that Jesus established to teach, guide, and sanctify all nations. It points to the living tradition of the Church handed down from one generation to the next, as Paul explicitly mentions in 1 Corinthians 11.2. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, 2 Timothy 3.11, and elsewhere. Jesus himself said that in the mouths of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. Well, the Catholic view, indeed the biblical view, is that these three witnesses are scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium of the church. <laughs> the biblical model of authority is not sola scriptura, as we shall demonstrate this evening. No, the biblical model is tripartite, three parts. The church established by Jesus Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit, Scripture, which is the written Word of God, and sacred tradition, in cohesion, these are the things that bring us into the fullest understanding of the apostolic deposit of faith. Bob very uh, graciously quoted Vatican II's description of the relationship. I'll quote it again, just so we're clear. Vatican II put it this way, In the supremely wise arrangement of God, sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium of the church are so connected and associated that not one of them can stand without the others. Working together, each in its own way, under the action of the Holy Spirit, they all contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. If that's not true, and our friends tonight want you to believe that that's not true, then when men run into scriptural passages that conflict with their own peculiar teachings, they're faced with a choice. A. They may either revise their views and bring them into line with the totality of what scripture teaches, or B. They may reject a portion of scripture in order to make it fit their own theological scheme. Martin Luther would be a good example of such a person who chose the second course of action. In Luther's works, volume 4, page 317, Luther said, quote, The epistle of James gives us much trouble. If they will not admit my interpretations, then I shall make rubble also of it. I almost feel like throwing Jimmy into the stove, end quote. This evening, we will examine in detail the very verses Protestants have brought up and do bring up, and those that Bob has brought up, in their attempt to prop up the theory of Sola Scriptura, and we'll show you, I hope convincingly, why no single one of them, taken alone or taken together, can demonstrate their position. But for the moment, in the remaining few minutes of my remarks, I'd like to emphasize an often overlooked refutation of Sola Scriptura, Protestantism itself. This is what we mean when we say sola scriptura is unworkable, and Protestantism proves it for us very nicely, although very tragically. Because as a principle for arriving at a sure knowledge of the truth, an infallible certainty of truth, sola scriptura fails miserably. And I'm going to ask our opponents to prove this point for us this evening. One example, Rod Rosenblatt is a Lutheran. Bob Godfrey is Reformed. Mike Horton is what's called a Reformed Episcopalian. So we're not exactly sure what that means, but we know that he's in there somewhere. <laughs> if we examine the key issues that are central to the message of the Gospel, you know, issues such as justification, salvation, the nature and purpose of baptism, baptismal regeneration, 
you'll see that these men disagree strongly on what these central issues mean. Yet each claims to go by the Bible alone in his methodology of arriving at his contradictory position. And when I say contradictory, I mean contradicting his friends in the body of Protestantism. So who is right? And more importantly, how can you know who is right? It's not enough for them to say, I'm right. How do you know they're right? We can all open the Bible and see what it says, but the real problem, the problem that we hope to solve in this debate tonight is, what does Scripture mean? And who or what has the final authority to say what it means? The idea of sola scriptura, my friends, is utterly alien to the gospel of Christ. It is not the model that we see in Scripture. It is definitely not the model we see in the Old Testament. It is not the model followed by the historic Christian church for the last 2,000 years. Sure, a group of people who broke off from the church in the 16th century began to follow it, but that is not the model that we see down through the ages. Our opponents cannot give you a definitive answer to this question, folks. They can only assert what they think to the best of their ability, what they think Scripture means, but nothing more. Since Martin Luther first raised on high the banner of hostility to the Catholic Church and began proclaiming the theory of sola scriptura, a never-ending process of quarreling, fragmentation, and disunity has resulted, as my friend Bob told you, I would say. I'm glad he told you that so that I can remind you that it's true. These reformers, beginning with Luther, following the theory of the Bible alone, ran into problems almost immediately. Soon after Luther came Calvin, who said, no, Luther got some of his theology wrong, and I am going to reform his Reformation. And then along came the Anabaptists and the Arminians and the Wesleyans and all sorts of other sects down through the ages, each one claiming to go by the Bible alone, each one claiming to reform or correct the errors in theology of the reformers who had come before. And unfortunately, each group coming up with its own set of erroneous conclusions. Sadly, this confusion and fragmentation that Sola Scriptura has caused is still galloping out of control. If you're a regular listener of the White Horse Inn radio program, or if you've read any of Michael Horton's books, you know how painfully obvious it is that Protestants cannot agree, even among themselves, as to the meaning of something as central and basic as justification. All claim to go by Scripture alone, yet they don't agree on these central issues. And what's worse, often they read each other out of Christianity when these disagreements arise. Let me illustrate. For example, in the February 1995 issue of the Chalcedon Report, a well-known evangelical publication, Reformed writer Andrew Sandlin attacks respected evangelical theologians such as R.C. Sproul and John Gerstner, men who are known to many of you in this audience. He attacks them for their understanding of the nature of justification, implying that they have betrayed the Reformation by departing from the theory of justification as propounded by Luther and Calvin. He says that they have deviated badly from the formula presented by Luther. Now, listen to these quotes from Gerstner. This quote. Gerstner says, quote, We do insist that the Holy Spirit unites the regenerate soul with Christ and produces faith and all the virtues along with it forever, which is the very substance of infused grace. Interesting phrase, infused grace. That has been attacked as Romanist by the Reformers down through the ages. He goes further. Quote, Justification does not refer to the state of man, but does not exclude it. If nothing were done to the man in justification, God would not look at him as justified. R.C. Sproul says something somewhat the same. Quote, the regeneration that precedes and engenders saving faith does effect a real change in the person who is justified. Though that change is by no means the ground of justification. That's the whole point of our debate tomorrow, folks. Does justification produce an inward change? R.C. Sproul sounds an awful lot like a Catholic when he says that. And he's being attacked as betraying the Reformation. Here's another way that we can look at the problem of sola scriptura. Take the phrase, I never said you stole money. Now think about that phrase for a minute. If I could write it in big letters, I never said you stole money. What does that mean? Well, I think we would all say that we have a pretty obvious understanding of what that means, but maybe not. What if the writer intended to say, I never said you stole money, but he did. Or what if he meant to say, I never said you stole money, but I sure thought it. Or what if he said, I never said you stole money, but he did. 
Or how about, I never said you stole money, but you stole my pig. Or I never said you stole money. Now, each of those senses is very, very different and means something radically different from the others. But if we look at the bare bones letters on the page without somebody to tell us what that person meant when he wrote those words, we are at a loss to know for sure what indeed he meant. But now imagine that somebody had been in the room when that person had written those words or had spoken them and he had heard the man say these things and furthermore he knew what the man said when he met, what he meant when he said them. That, my friends, is the role of Christ's church, to teach with the authority of Christ. Jesus said, he who listens to you listens to me, and he who rejects you rejects me, Luke 10, 16. In John 14, 25 and John 16, 13, we're told that the church is guided by the Holy Spirit, and not just the magisterium. The church is the people of God, saints and sinners, priests, the priesthood of all believers, the Catholic Church teaches. All of us are guided in, by the Holy Spirit, and in a special way, the magisterium has this charism of guidance as well. The church that Jesus established is not against the Bible. It is there to protect and safeguard the proper interpretation of the Bible. Otherwise, as we've seen over and over and over again since the Protestant Reformation, the Bible becomes the private play toy of any individual exegete or self-styled theologian. If you disagree with me, then listen to Harold Camping sometime on family radio and listen to some of the amazing and absurd conclusions that he draws from Scripture. I think the uh, appropriate theme song for the Protestant Reformation would not be A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. No offense to Rod there. I think the appropriate theme song would be I Did It My Way. <laughs> the only problem is that each individual reformer could say the same song and mean something very different by that. Even Luther himself recognized that these things were getting out of hand with Sola Scriptura as the misguiding force behind the Reformation, and he admitted in his letter against Zwingli, quote, if the world lasts long, it will be again necessary on account of the different interpretations of Scripture which now exist, that to preserve the unity of faith, we should receive the counsels and decrees and fly to them for refuge. So, in summation, there are two choices set before you tonight, my friends. A. To understand scripture in the light of the way the church Jesus established has always understood it. Or B, to trust the hunches and feelings and best guesses and strong opinions and bold words of the men who think they know what scripture means but aren't infallibly certain. I choose the path taken by Christ's church. The important question is, which path will you choose? Thank you. In debating Sola Scriptura, I feel like I'm debating my alter ego because I once believed it very firmly. There are a few verses that are cited to prove Sola Scriptura, but I will concentrate on the main verse that Professor Godfrey used, 2 Timothy 3:16 and 17. He also quoted from 1 Corinthians 4, 6, the interesting phrase, do not go beyond what is written. And there is a thorough exegesis of that passage on the back table if you would like to browse through it or even purchase it. By using 2 Timothy 3.16, I assume that Professor Godfrey feels that sola scriptura must be proved by the scripture. I say that because there are some proponents of that theory who say it does not have to be proved by scripture. It is just assumed. Professor Godfrey said he hoped that we won't treat 2 Timothy 3 very lightly. I assure you that we will not. But I feel that is exactly what he has done, treat it very lightly. In the context of 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul is not setting up a contest between Scripture and other sources of revelation. The context is not setting up a contest to see which source is sufficient over another source in making the man of God thoroughly equipped. If a doctrine of solo scriptura were on Paul's mind, here was the perfect opportunity to make it clear and unambiguous. On other major doctrines, Paul is not unclear. There is a resurrection coming, according to 1 Corinthians 15. In Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. We are saved by grace. These are clear. But sola scriptura is not clear in 2 Timothy 3.16. Protestant apologists make the argument that the two words used by Paul in verse 17 
Artios and Exartismenos, and you'll find that if you read the passage, the man of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work, mean the man of God is sufficiently equipped, and thus the scripture must be the sufficient equipper. First, Artios and Exartismenos have quite a semantic range. Depending on what lexicon you use, they can mean anything from fit or suitable to perfect or sufficient. Since artios is only used in 2 Timothy 3.17 and exartismenos is used one other time in Acts 21 verse 5 in the infinitive form and once in the Septuagint, it is hard to know what semantic range Paul is giving these words. We would not be out of line to be suspicious of meanings foisted upon these words that automatically connoted some sort of absolute sufficiency. With such a semantic range, one might wonder why Paul chose such infrequent and obscure words if he had in mind the absolute sufficiency of Scripture. Whatever semantic range we assign to artios and exartismenos is not as consequential when we understand that they are describing the man of God, not the Scripture. The argument is advanced that if we take the most superlative definition of artios and exartismenos, and conclude that the man of God is sufficiently equipped, complete, and perfect for every good work, does this not imply that the scripture is sufficient to do the job? On a qualitative basis, we could definitely hold that scripture is sufficient, complete, and perfect, for it contains no errors, the canon is closed and complete, and scripture speaks well to us. But that is not what sola scriptura advocates want or even mean. The word sola in sola scriptura is numerical, and thus they push for a quantitative sufficiency of scripture. But quantitatively, scripture is not complete or perfect. Quantitatively, the scripture Paul is referring to in 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16 is only the Old Testament, which he says to Timothy that he had known since he was a child in verse 15. Qualitatively, these scriptures were sufficient to instruct in areas of salvation, as Paul says in verse 15 of the Old Testament, quote, which are able to make you wise into salvation. In Romans 10, for example, Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 30, which says the word is in your mouth and in your heart, the word of faith, which means that, yes, Deuteronomy was sufficient qualitatively to give us the message of salvation. But the context of 2 Timothy, the rest of Scripture itself, history and practicality will show us that Scripture is not the only quantitative source to sufficiently equip Timothy for every good work. This quantitative insufficiency of Scripture is already hinted at in Paul's choice of words to describe the Scripture. He says it is profitable or useful. Why? Because it's qualitative character. It's inspired by God. But why didn't Paul say, Scripture is inspired and sufficient? There were plenty of Greek words he could have used to connote the idea of superlative sufficiency. It is a well-known fact that the Greeks had a word for everything. The word profitable is from the Greek word ophelomos. Something that is merely profitable or useful implies that it is not sufficient in and of itself, but that there are other sources that are profitable as well. Protestant apologists will argue, yes, but scripture is the only infallible source that is profitable and therefore stands alone among all other sources. He is begging the question because the opponents haven't first proved that there are no other infallible sources other than scripture. Paul certainly does not claim this in the passage or other texts and there are no other that there are no other infallible sources of truth. Second, Paul alludes to another infallible source right in the context under discussion. In 2 Timothy 1.13, Paul says, What you have heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. In other words, what Timothy heard, not what he read, he was to keep as teaching and guard it from destruction. Were Paul's oral instructions on how to run the church merely his own words? Not according to 1 Thessalonians 2.13, which says, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it is actually the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. 
In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, again, Paul says, The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable men. In 2 Timothy 3.10 and 14, Paul says, You, however, know all about my teaching. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it. Oral teaching. Hence, it is clear that Timothy has another infallible source to depend upon, the orally inspired word of God. This oral word is not only for Timothy, but it was to be entrusted to reliable men, to be kept as a pattern, to be guarded, in other words, to be passed down and preserved. How can there be a doctrine of Sola Scriptura buzzing around in Paul's head with this kind of glaring evidence to the contrary? But more important, the Protestant's argument, Scripture is the only infallible source, is a straw man. As mentioned before, Paul is not setting up a contest in the context between competing infallible sources, nor a contest of infallible versus fallible sources. He is concerned about one thing. What will equip Timothy to be the finest and best equipped man possible? Scripture is profitable to do this, but what other sources are there? Whether they are fallible or infallible is not the crucial question here in Paul's mind at this point in time. Timothy is the crucial question. The text imitate, it intimates that Timothy was struggling in his Christian life. In the immediate context of 2 Timothy 2, 19 and 21, Paul mentions another source. Paul says that one must turn away from wickedness and cleanse himself from evil. If he does so, Paul says, he will be, quote, made holy, to the, useful to the master, and prepared to do every good work. Lo and behold, the phrase, every good work, is the same exact phrase that's used in 2 Timothy 3.17. Pan ergon agathon. Here we see the ultimate goal of Paul in the context is to see Timothy adequately ready for every good work, not a dissertation on sola scriptura. Now we have three sources from which Timothy can draw to accomplish his goal. His own character development as a Christian, Paul's early inspired teaching, and of course, the scriptures. Lest anyone think that 2 Timothy 2.21 uses weaker words than 2 Timothy 3.17, the word prepared that Paul uses from the Greek hediomazo has about the same semantic range as artios in 3.17. It is used for anything from the ordinary preparation to divine preparation. What other indications of these sources are in the context? In 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul tells Timothy to do his best to present himself to God as one approved, a workman who should not be ashamed. Timothy's character then must be impeccable, otherwise he will not be useful to the master. And Paul says, and who correctly handles the word of truth. Some will try to argue that the word of truth refers only to scripture. That was not done tonight, and I applaud them for that. But we have already seen that the word of God is Paul's oral teaching. Now, if 2 Timothy 3.16 is used to prove Sola Scriptura, we have an untenable anachronism developed. For if Timothy is to understand 2 Timothy 3.16 to teach nothing but Sola Scriptura, neither entertaining nor seeking any other interpretation, then what was Timothy to do with Paul's early inspired teaching given at the same time as the writing of 2 Timothy, and which he was told to keep and to guard by Paul, especially after Paul's ensuing death is alluded to in the context? And what was Timothy to do with the fact that Scripture was not yet complete and wouldn't be so for decades, nor was it authenticated and canonized? Is Timothy to make a strong mental effort to stop thinking about Paul's inspired oral messages and cease from passing it around and entrusting it to reliable men, as he was told to do? Does Paul even raise such a mandate or contest of sources in the context? Does Paul ever give some qualifying statement to Timothy, which stated in so many words that, though he realized that 2 Timothy 3.16 was strongly teaching Sola Scriptura, that Timothy should ignore this for now and keep holding to Paul's oral teachings and entrusting them down to reliable men? No, there is no such qualifying statement in Scripture. He said his oral teaching was to be preserved and propagated throughout the church, and he gave no indication that this was contingent upon the completion of the canon, or that someday inspired oral teaching should be ignored, demoted, or was to be looked upon with suspicion with when Paul died, when the scripture was completed, or when the Bible was canonized. It just ain't there. I am coming out on the short end of the time. My colleagues have been 
long-winded, <laughs> eloquent, <laughs> wonderful, and I'm left holding the bag. I want to raise the question, who's sola scriptura? We often think that this is a simple, clear idea. It is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a simple claim. I shall show that at least nine distinct propositions are involved in sola scriptura. At least nine distinct propositions, and each of them dubious, is involved in a full-feathered version of Sola Scriptura. There are less downy versions, for example, in the Augsburg Confession. But for the full-feathered thing, you should turn to the Westminster Confession. And so, if you will, some of you uh, may know the text well. I uh, probably am not going to have time to read all of the beautiful language that's 17th century language thrills my soul. But uh, aesthetic considerations aside, we must summarize. In its first chapter, the Westminster Confession, first of all, tells us that God has pleased to reveal himself in diverse manners, but that afterwards... For the better preserving and propagating of the truth, it pleased God to commit the same wholly unto writing. So here we have proposition number one, that all God has revealed has passed into writing. Now that creates a bit of a problem about the interpretation of Galatians 3.23, when it says we were under the law until faith was revealed. Until the mystery of faith what, yeah, was revealed. Now, the faith whereby you and I are justified is not in writing. Right? What's in writing in Scripture is a description of that faith. So, I presume that proposition means that all the propositional content which God has revealed has passed into writing. But notice... But this claim already means that there's no sense in which non-written things are revealed, that is to say, put into the world by divine power, things that have come down from eternity and are here, are not to be called revealed in any sense, according to this proposition. In any case, we have seen that there is no place in Scripture where it says that all the propositional content of divine revelation has passed into writing. We have yet to see a text brought forward which clearly says that. Now, the next paragraph in the Westminster, Con or lists, I should say, the, the Hebrew canon and the canon of the New Testament, and we don't disagree about uh, that part, but then there's the next paragraph, three, which says that the Apocrypha, not being of the commonly called Apocrypha, well, all right, not being of divine inspiration are no part of the canon of Scripture. We don't commonly call them Apocrypha, but we'll allow the Calvinist community to have its own common usages. In any case, we now have a proposition here which says that the books in the Alexandrian canon, but not the Palestinian or Hebrew canon, are not inspired. And furthermore, in conflict with the Church of England, it says they are to be treated as any other human writings, all right? The same way as you would treat secular literature. No room for a middle ground that says these things are especially profitable, which was at least... Um, that the, the view in, the, um, in previous Christian uh, teaching of all those who had even any doubts at all about their canonicity. Many said they are at least highly profitable and to be treasured. No room for a middle ground here. Would you please tell me where it says in Scripture, okay, 
that 2 Maccabees is not inspired? Would you please tell me where it says that the book of wisdom is not inspired? Where in canonical scripture is there any such declaration that the whole class of writings is not inspired and not canonical? It doesn't say that in scripture, does it? But if you don't add proposition number two here, that these books are not in a can and are not inspired, if you don't add that proposition, you have made a major mistake about the extent of the revealed message and the texts which convey it, O oh, historical Protestants. So, you'd better not easily abandon Proposition 2. We go on. The clock goes on, too, to my great disconcertation. Is that a word? Dis no. It's <laughs> just a matter of who's the master. The man of the word. Oh, yeah. All right. The next two uh, sections of the Westminster Confession tell us that the authority of Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself the author thereof, and therefore is to be received because it is the word of God. Then it says various reasons can be found to revere the scriptures, yet not with un notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward word of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. Now, both of these sections confuse the issue of the motive of faith. That is to say, why do we believe God speaking with the quite different issue of what evidence is there? that this is a text in which God is speaking. Do you see the difference? The part about the interior work of the Holy Spirit confuses the cause of our willingness to believe with that same evidence that this is a text in which God is speaking. Those are quite distinct issues. We don't have a quarrel here about the motive of faith. The reason to believe a divine revelation is because God says it. He who is subsistent truth, he who can never deceive, neither deceive nor be deceived. We don't have a quarrel about that. But the effect of these two sections is to eliminate the problem of evidence about the canon and to yield us proposition number three. The canonical books disclose themselves to be such to one enjoying the inner help of the Holy Spirit. Evidently, the inner help of the Holy Spirit was not present then to quite a few people in the first two Christian centuries who were unsure about some of these books. It must not have been too clear to Luther either, who had doubts not only about James, but also about the Epistle to the Hebrews. All right, this is the problem of the canon. And the Westminster Confession says nothing about it. Next, we are told an amazing thing in the long sixth paragraph about the whole counsel of God being either set forth in Scripture expressly or deducible from what is expressed. We are told, in effect, that the Word of God has what it takes to be a deductive system in which, from axioms explicit in Scripture, the, quote, whole counsel of God, unquote, can be deduced, either by necessary consequences or by application of general principles to particular cases. Where does it say in Scripture that there is that kind of logical fertility to the clearest and most explicit passages? You see, I am smitten of God and afflicted. <laughs> there is much left to attack. Let's go on. <coughs> no thing or proposition is ever to be added to this system, it says. It says that matters of church order and worship are left up to natural reason and Christian prudence 
to arrange in any way we please consistent with general scriptural principles. Does the monopiscopal arrangement which appears in every church we have any knowledge of in the second century count as fulfilling this um, requirement? If not, then already in the second century the um, principle of sola scriptura was being violated. Every proposition necessary to be known for salvation is so clear in at least one passage of scripture, continues the Westminster Confession, that even unlearned persons can reach a sufficient understanding of them. Even unlearned persons. If this is true, then the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist must not be a proposition necessary to be known for salvation. And we shall see that an immense body of the church fathers explicitly deny sola scriptura and therefore I put it to you what is the probability that sola scriptura itself is so clear in any one passage of scripture that even unlearned persons can reach a sufficient understanding of that doctrine it didn't work for Augustine it didn't work for Jerome it didn't work for Chrysostom they were evidently not unlearned persons. Is sola scriptura then necessary to be known for salvation? Or have the enormous number of Christians, including quite a few Anglicans, I might add, who have not accepted it, lacked what is necessary for salvation? I decline to go into the Hebrew and Greek text of the Bible, which comes up next. All of a sudden, the Westminster Confession switches from the message of God, what God says, the meaning of God speaking, and turns to the text that conveys the meaning. And says that the Hebrew and Greek text of the Bible has been kept pure in all ages by God's special care and providence. It was under the influence of this part of the Westminster Confession that there was a desperate attempt to save the Textus Receptus, the form of the New Testament text which was in vogue from the 4th century down to the 19th when older and better manuscripts were found. If the Textus Receptus wasn't perfect, the Bible had not been kept pure in all ages. Well, on a Perhaps too strict interpretation of the requirement. But where in Scripture does it say that by the special counsel of God, the special providence of God, the text of Scripture will be preserved? Where is that in Scripture? Friends, don't say it stands to reason that God would preserve his text. Of course it does. But it also stands to reason that God would provide with his text an authoritative Interpreter, just as the founding fathers of our nation provided along with the Constitution by whose construal alone all matters are to be resolved, a court with authority to declare what it means. That too stands to reason. <clears throat> In the end, there are nine. Nine propositions. Nine propositions. How about four? Doctor. No, no, nine propositions. You decide how many of them you think are clear in Scripture. If any are not, any of them are not, then those must go because sola scriptura has the character of a self referential proposition. It's like saying, I'm not speaking. That refutes itself, doesn't it? So if these propositions are not in Scripture, Sola Scriptura refutes itself. Thank you very much. Thank you for both sides. Ten minutes each. The Roman Catholic side will begin take the podium and address questions to the Protestant side. So let me turn it over to the first cross-examiner. 
I stayed up late last night preparing for this debate. I think I might have stayed up a little too late because I didn't sleep all that well. And I had a dream that I'd like to share with you. I dreamed that I had, uh, for some reason, I had shown up in purgatory. And I apparently had to spend some time there and I was being shown around. The first room I came to very, very large room with millions of people standing on their heads. And I said, no, I, I don't want this room. So we went into the second room. There, there were an equal number of people standing on their heads in about two feet of water. And I said, well, I definitely don't want this room because these people were not only moaning and groaning, but they were choking and, and gasping for air. So I went to the third room and this room was different. There were an equal number of people there, but these folks were standing upright, as I am now, and they had cups of coffee and tea, and they were chatting amiably. The only problem is that they were standing up to their knees in raw sewage. But I thought, well, how bad can this room be? I'll take this one. So I went over, I got a cup of coffee, and I stood there chatting. At about that moment, an angel came in and said, okay, folks, coffee break's over. Back on your heads. And now, you may, you may, in fact, feel that way now. I hope not. But let me begin our cross-examination with a question that was raised by Bob in his opening remarks, a question that I have heard raised before and I've responded to it in debates before. I'm somewhat surprised to see it come up again. And that is the relationship between 2 Timothy 3.16 and other parallel passages. Bob was kind enough to read several for us. First of all, let me say I will ask this question, then I will cede the floor to my colleagues who have other questions to ask. You mentioned, Bob, that 2 Timothy 3.16 is a verse which argues for sufficiency, or verses 16 and 17 taken in toto, argues for sufficiency. And you spent a little time dealing with the language there. One of the things you pointed out was that this word, artios, and this word, exartismenos, are both implying something about Scripture, implying that it can make the man of God useful. My question is this. You reject parallel verses such as James 1.4, and I'd like to know why. Actually, I do know why. It's because it refutes the Protestant argument of Sola Scriptura, but I would like to tell, have them tell us in their own words why. In First James, or pardon me, James 1.4, James says, And let perseverance be perfect. The Greek word there is teleos. So that you may be perfect, again, a derivative of teleos, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I have argued before, as Bob knows and Mike and Rod know, that this verse, if Sola Scriptura can be found, if the Bible can be found to be sufficient in 2 Timothy 3.16, then it would seem that perseverance in, in, in suffering and in good deeds, which is the theme of James, will bring the man of God to sufficiency. But it uses more forceful language. It says, perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. I agree. The Greek word there is teleos. It is a different word. But it is a stronger word. It means perfection. Whereas artios and exartismenos do not mean that ordinarily. They mean something less strong. So I would like you to explain how it is that this verse does not qualify as a parallel verse. Bearing in mind one last point. We do not agree, we do not hold, that James 1.4 does teach sufficiency for perseverance, nor do we hold that it's taught in 2 Timothy. Well, I, I raised the point that I did because um, you have to do a lot more ex exegetical and linguistic examination if you're going to claim that a passage that has, the two passages that have two different words are in fact parallel, and you have to look at the broader context in each case, uh, in, in James 1, uh, verse 4, um, uh, Paul is talking about uh, the suffering that the people of God will undergo and how that will test their faith and that the testing of faith is valuable because it produces perseverance. And if that uh, testing of faith in the full context of the life of the Christian uh, goes on as it must and as it will, it will uh, uh, make the, uh, the Christian having uh, suffered and having undergone the whole Christian life in the midst of that suffering complete and not, not lacking anything. So I, I think uh, in, 
in the genuine context of what uh, James is, is arguing there, uh, it, makes, it makes perfect sense, and it's talking about the whole Christian life as it's lived in a condition of suffering and how perseverance uh, in that suffering life and with all of the aids that God has given for the Christian life will, in fact, uh, make one mature. I think sometimes uh, um, Mr. Madrid has not fully escaped his fundamentalism in just taking a verse sort of out of context and uh, uh, holding on to it in a I strange sort of I way. I never entered fundamentalism, much less escaped it. Well, I'm glad to hear that, but nonetheless, you seem to, to, to argue in a parallel manner. Um, and, and so I, I just don't see the parallel of this text. The, the word isn't the same. The, 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 the point of the discussion isn't the same. And, uh, and I'm not arguing in, in a negative, uh, uh, excuse me, in, in a narrowly focused way with, with uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, although that's what my uh, uh, opponents seem to keep suggesting. Um, uh, I tried to show the whole uh, context and character of this uh, section from James, and, and particularly the importance there of, uh, I mean, of Timothy, of, of 2 Timothy 3.15. How from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to do what? To make you wise for salvation. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, the, the whole point we're trying to argue under Sola Scriptura is that the Holy Scriptures make us wise for salvation. Uh, there may be other things the Scriptures do do and should do and can do, uh, but, but the narrow focus of our uh, discussion on Sola Scriptura is that the Scriptures can teach us salvation because they teach us all that's necessary for salvation. And, and, we have uh, another question, actually. I, I, yeah, I, I hate to cut, cut you off, but to, just to do that so that we could fit in a couple of other questions. Um, Would you prefer to ask them from there? Or, or? Yeah. Okay. yeah, this would be easier for us. Is that okay with you? Sure. Will we go? Hello out there. I want to know if you're familiar with what St. John Chrysostom says in his commentary on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 15. Not offhand. Okay, well let us bring this matter of interest before the audience and then perhaps you'd like to comment on it. You had quoted Christum as saying that um, to Timothy that, that your verse means that since you now have scripture for a master, uh, you, you have it instead of me. You can learn from it all you need. All right, here's what Chrysostom says on 2 Thessalonians 2.15. He quotes the text, Therefore, brethren, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions which you have learned, whether by word of mouth or through our letter. Hence, it is clear that not all points have been handed down by epistle, but many also without writing. And these as well as those are worthy of faith. Hence, we also think the church's tradition is worthy of faith. Can a believer in Sola Scriptura say that? Uh, I did not uh, uh, say that uh, uh, John Chrysostom uh, believed uh, in Sola Scriptura. Uh, I did not uh, say that John Chrysostom was infallible in everything that he said, and I suspect that since he was only a patriarch of Constantinople, you wouldn't think so either. Um, But it was before the split. We'll let him stand. were, Were patriarchs infallible before the split? When they, agreed, when they agreed with the whole body of the episcopate as he did. Let me put to you another I, well, question. Well, could I answer the question? Please. Um, I, I quoted John Chrysostom because I thought he was an important um, ancient witness to how 2 Timothy 3 should be understood. Uh, and uh, on the interpretation of 2 Timothy 3, I think he sounds very much... Uh, like the position that I want to take in interpreting 2 Timothy 3. We as Protestants treasure the fathers, but have never thought that they were infallible or that there were no uh, contradiction. Could I finish the sentence, please? We do not consider the fathers infallible. It's not in debate here. I know, but all I'm saying is, therefore, I have no trouble in saying that Chrysostom, I think, rightly understood this text and may have wrongly understood another. I I don't agree with the statement of Chrysostom that you just read. The the distinction, though, is that you disagree when he disagrees with you. And you think he interpreted it correctly when he agrees with you. And that is really not solving anything, Bob. That's just begging the question. But that's exactly what you do. You agree with the fathers when, it, when, it, when, you, when the fathers agree with the bishop of Rome. And when they disagree with the bishop of Rome, you don't agree with them. So I don't see any significant distinction between the way we deal with the fathers there. So you would agree then that begging the question is an appropriate way to argue this issue. I don't think so. No, I'm not begging and the question because we as Protestants have never granted any infallible authority to tradition uh, or to the fathers, uh, or, or argued some kind of unanimity to the fathers. 
Bob, we have just a few seconds left. Uh, you say the Bible teaches sola scriptura. You say that this is clearly taught. Would you please show me a clear, perspicuous, unambiguous passage which teaches sola scriptura, other than 2 Timothy 3.16, which I feel I've disproved already. And please address the quantitative assertion engendered in the word sola and not the mere quality of scripture. Please do not give me an argument from silence by saying something like Jesus did not refer to tradition or that the scripture is perfect, which is a qualitative argument. Show me a verse of scripture that says scripture is quantitatively the only infallible source for faith and practice. Well, I, uh, I don't grant for a minute that you answered in any satisfactory way the exegesis uh, I suggested of 2 Timothy uh, 3. Um, but, but putting that aside, I've heard no response at all to what uh, I quoted from Deuteronomy 31 and uh, 32. Uh, Moses says, of the written law, this is your life. Listen to it and obey it. Uh, I, I don't see how anything could be any clearer than that. Where does, where does Moses say that that was the only way to understand God's infallible truth? We've never said it is the only way to understand God's infallible truth. We've said it's all that's necessary for salvation. That's the point of sola scriptura that you gentlemen have not really responded to. I thought the word sola meant only. Sola scriptura, as a slogan of the Reformation, was part of the doctrine that said scripture is sufficient to teach us all we need to know about salvation. And that's what's proven. Is it the only... Well, on, on that note, I think we have to call time on the first cross-examination. Always keep in mind prima caritas. Uh, prima veritas. <laughs> They're one and the same. But now for the second cross-examination, let me invite the Protestant side, and you have ten minutes or thereabout. I'd like to point out a few, I haven't got my glasses, I left them back there, so I'm going to be looking uh, as if I'm nearsighted, which I am. Uh, a few of the logical problems that are involved, um, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but here I really invite you to go to an introductory logic text uh, and uh, take a look at some of these. I'll mention them just because I want them to go on the tape. Uh, but there it calls, uh, you're called upon to go do, doing a little bit of looking later on. In Mr. Madrid's presentation, the entire argument begs the question, if we want to talk also about formal and material sufficiency, which came up under various guises uh, as uh, the presentation went on, you have no proof of the categories there. They've always brought those in. We've never known what they are. Um, we have a formal and material principle, but they can be understood uh, by most people. In the Protestant faith, formal principle means where do you get your information? And the material principle is, what's the central stuff of it? The Reformers said the formal principle was sola scriptura, and the material principle was the gospel of Christ. Uh, in the way in which they're at, uh, using the words are not uh, parallel to that at all. You've got to prove those kinds of categories. Um, Pat made mention of many, many errors, uh, but said he wouldn't name one. That's the same as arguing uh, that you have all 52 pages of quotations from the fathers, but you don't have time to cite them. We have to them. more than that tonight. Uh, it's interesting, John Henry Cardinal Newman was the one who termed the logical fault poisoning the well when he was in conflict with Kingsley. Uh, or you sometimes will hear it said that it's always the mark of the heretics that they quote Bible verses. Logical, the logical fault involved here is poisoning the well. It makes it impossible to answer without looking as if you're supporting your opponent's side. Sure, I would want to quote Bible verses, and Bob has done it. Uh, of course we would want to, but, and do. But you can't say uh, that there are many errors, but we won't name any. If it's not found in scripture, they said, it's self-refuting. Logically, that's an appeal to ignorance. It could be that these three up here can't prove something. That doesn't show that it's false. It just shows that the three up here aren't very bright. What? Oh, all right. All right. This is the question phase of the oh, debate. Then I'm going to go to here to the power. Sorry. 
Does anyone get to answer? Pardon? Does anyone get to answer at this point? Is that a question? I mean, sure, why don't you? The power book's powering up, and I've got enough C devs in her nits, it'll take ten minutes. <laughs> I, I think just in fairness to the to one of the questions that you asked, and since it, it pertained to my opening remarks, I'd like to deal with that, although briefly. Uh, yes, I do think that uh, Bob made a number of um, inaccuracies in his statements. I, I can enumerate some now for you. Number one, he said that Trent's anathema means that Protestants are accursed, and that is absolutely incorrect. Uh, the Catholic Church has gone uh, to great lengths to explain the fact that as a technical canonical term, anathema means let him be cut off. Let him be separated from the unity of the church. And uh, I think using loaded language like that, uh, and if, if somebody had studied Trent carefully, they would realize that it doesn't mean accursed. And loaded language, I think, is counterproductive. He said that parallel passages do not help to clarify the meaning of 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. He enumerated several of them, but didn't deal with any of them. I disagree. I think that's an inaccurate statement. Parallel passages do help to clarify the meaning of 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. He said that Gregory the Great, this is one of my favorite Protestant conundrums, he said that Gregory the Great was uh, denying, in essence, uh, the role of the Pope, as the Catholic Church understands it, and that somehow this was a conflicting tradition between Catholic popes. Well, I've done quite a bit of study on this issue, and if you read the letter that Gregory wrote to John the Faster, the Patriarch of Constantinople, it becomes very, very clear that he was indeed asserting his primacy of jurisdiction over that bishop, and he was telling him that he was not to, to claim the title of universal bishop in the sense that many people understood John the Faster meant it. And that was that he was the bishop, and in a sense there were no other bishops. He was the bishop for the universal church. That clearly is wrong, and Gregory would have denied that. Uh, he said that um, popes and councils are not needed to know the canon. Well, that's a, a comforting thought, I think, for many in this room, but it doesn't work. Because if uh, Bob and Mike and Rod open their Bibles and look at the New Testament canon, lo and behold, they have the canon that these Catholic popes and councils came up with. Not a different one. Uh, he said, uh, well, I could go on. But those are a few of the inaccuracies that I found in Bob's statement. And just, I just want to set the record straight. We can talk about any of them in more detail if you'd like. Yeah, uh let me go on to the next question. It's the position of the Roman Church that the Church gave us the Scriptures. It's also the position of the Roman Church that the Church has the right to take away the Scriptures from the laity. The Church giveth and the Church taketh away. But all of this would, of course, be for the laity's own good. Further, it's the position of the Roman Church that doctrine develops. It would seem from these things that there's nothing in principle preventing there coming a time when the Church might take the Scriptures away from the laity. The Church giveth and the Church taketh away, and even substitute another book in their place. What intellectual defense could you offer, given that this question is not a hypothetical, but simply an instantiation of Rome's own already publicly published dicta or data? Well, uh, this is Chemnitz come back to life. Once again, we have the charge. <laughs> He's flattered. We have the charge that the Roman Church took away from the laity. That is simply not true. The canon at the Council of Trent that is being discussed here is a purely disciplinary canon. It does not entirely, it never was meant, it never did entirely remove the scriptures in the vernacular from the laity. But it urged bishops, told bishops to use their discretion at a time of great emergency to control the circulation of unauthorized versions of the Bible, like versions of the Bible with important books left out and so on. Now, that sort of thing had to be looked at, that's all. But uh, the general policy of the church has always been that the laity is encouraged to read the scriptures. That's been especially true in the 20th century and especially true in our own day since the Second Vatican Council. But in any case, the <clears throat> church could never take away the scriptures themselves because they are not the church's property to dispose of, but rather her property to hold and guard. Right? Depositum fidei, O Timothy, keep the deposit. Scripture is a key part of that deposit, as has been declared in several general councils. There's no question that we would consider impossible the total removal of the scriptures. And therefore, the last part of that question was bombastic. 
I would like to add that the first English translation of the Bible was in the 8th century. There were 14 versions of the German Bible before Luther ever came on the scene. The Bible permeated the life and culture and the liturgy of the church. If you would read a Catholic commentary on history rather than a Protestant commentary, you would find that out. I was amazed to find that out when I became a Catholic. I had thought that they did obscure the scriptures. Could we try another one? Since I lost three minutes, I'll take those three minutes yes. back from the... Protestants and Catholics would undoubtedly agree that according to God's absolute will, he could have made a written document the sole authority in the church. We would further no doubt agree that it was his ordained will to allow the fall with the result that the human heart became hard-hearted toward the things of God. The question is, would God have had the power to inspire a written document and make it the sole authority in the church, charging a fault of misunderstanding to the sinful human heart? Following the scriptures, the Protestants believe that misunderstanding the scriptures is to be charged to the hard-heartedness of people, not to God's shoddy skills in written communications. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. When Jesus speaks in parables, a method chosen purposely to make understanding difficult, he lays ultimate responsibility for misunderstanding not on his words but on those who hear them and fail to understand Quoting the prophet Isaiah, Jesus says, this people's, hearts, this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and I would heal them. The implication is that even in the case where God has purposely spoken in an obscure manner, people could still understand the scriptures if they were not so hard-hearted. Was Jesus wrong when he taught that? No, he was not. I'd like to ask a question as a way of answering that, and that is, if you apply the very principle that you're defending here tonight, sola scriptura, to a key issue such as baptismal regeneration, uh, two of you I can identify for sure disagree on that issue. Mike, I'm not sure well, where you fall in that category. Uh, Rod, you believe in baptismal regeneration based on what the scripture says. Yes. Bob denies that, says that baptismal regeneration is not true. Baptism is merely the sign and seal of the inward change that God had made through sanctification. Which of you is the hard-hearted one? Which of you is the blind one? Which of you is the ignorant one? Both of you are going to the scriptures and you're coming up with diametrically opposed views. And under the rubric that you just specified, one of you must be blind, ignorant, and unwilling to look at the truth. No, it, we wouldn't have to draw it out like that, that you are a hard-hearted man, therefore you don't see it. We don't hold to the position that the scripture is basically obscure and dark. Right. We can always say to each other, I thought of something else, I'm going to call you. But we're always going to the bar of that. Right. We don't have a church that can solve this for us. See, that's the unfortunate thing. And we invite you back to the church that can solve this I for understand. you. I understand. Evidently, I understand. With, with some of the history, though, uh, you'll, you'll understand that Protestants are not especially uh, impressed with what was going on just prior to the Reformation. They'll be invited back, but I thank you for the offer. <laughs> Rod, we'll, we'll leave the light on for you. If I, if I may, if I might... Yeah, we, we've got one minute. Okay, if I might ask one question on that same point. You know, there's a real romanticism here that people ought to recognize. Uh, they're reading back a really Victorian, uh, John Cardinal Henry Newman view of the church that isn't there in the history. Uh, popes recognized they contradicted each other. Councils recognized they contradicted each other. That wasn't a problem for them as it is for our opponents. Arians, Nestorians, Pelagians, popes sometimes favored one heresy and then recognized that that heresy was in fact a heresy. In the 14th and 15th centuries, three popes reigned and all of Europe was under the excommunication of one pope or another. It was the Avignon Papacy. In the 16th century, 12 schools ruled at the Sorbonne uh, and condemned each other as heretical. Today, you have even more diversity with Ratzinger, King, Schillebix, Rahner, and others. You seem to have the same problem that we do. You, your magisterium doesn't seem to clear things up any uh, better than uh, our lack of clarity in understanding the scriptures. Uh, that's a question? I'm, yes. Okay. Rhetorical. Well, very rhetorical. rhetorical. By the way, Mike, long. welcome. I just wanted to say hi to you. Thank you. Yeah. I was lonely. <laughs> um, Granted, we are... Uh, I'm going to take this one. Granted, we, uh, there are controversies all throughout Christian history. And thank God for the Catholic Church that it was strong enough to squash the Arian heresy and every other heresy that came down the pike. Not there, heresy. Yeah, we still have to work on a couple. 
Um, the fact is that if you look at the official statements of the Catholic Church, not what Hans Kuhn believes, not what Karl Rahner believes, not what some heretic in the 13th century believed who claimed he was Pope, but what the official Catholic Church teaching is, there is one deposit of faith and there are many heretics who may choose to believe that faith or not believe that faith. So it is a straw man argument to attack people who differed with the Catholic Church within the Catholic Church when we claim that the official teaching has never changed. If you can point to one dogma that has changed in 2,000 years, I'll become a Protestant again. Thank you again for the cross-examination. Now we now move into the rebuttal mode, and first the Protestant rebuttal. I'll pick up where I left off. Uh, we were talking about some of the informal fallacies. I just want to make um, note of these. You'll just have to do it on your own, but you can do it in any intro uh, to uh, logic. When Pat was doing the uh, clever illustration, I never said you stole money. Actually, there are people in the universities today who love this sort of thing. They're called deconstructionists. This is really just a sort of veiled form of relativism. Uh, to say that uh, to that and then extrapolate to the men who heard it might be able to help. I hope they would, that they could explain uh, what it meant, but it also falls prey to the fallacy of composition. Pius IX did not stand next to Christ uh, so that he might explain all due deference. Uh, the false dichotomy that you'll find throughout that the Word of God is Paul's oral teaching presented at the same time as Paul's writing of Second Timothy. Can't they be the same thing? Uh, bifurcating or forcing a choice here might not, might not uh, be absolutely necessary. Now, if you're uh, sort of feeling through all of this, as is so much uh, our want in doing these things, that is, I got lost in the first seven minutes I came in here, what's going on? There are a couple of things. One is you can get the tape and go over this more slowly later on and see uh, whom do you think makes more and better sense, and you can do it slowly. That's one straightforward and simple thing. But I want to go to the more practical in this sense. Suppose you were a poor lay believer, and you're facing arguments like this. It's one thing to face them in a book, and there you have time to check to see uh, what the Father said, by the way, there's going to be one of these coming out. I might as well give a free plug, can't I, to Webster? You'll have one of these coming out where he's done just a massive, uh, but that's yet to be published and we are not allowed to use that, but it is coming. Webster, Bill Webster, and I think he's been on the phone to you guys, hasn't he? Several times. Yeah, I th he will publish that, and uh, uh, that's just what, a what free plug for him. Uh, uh, it's going to publish? One of the things that's going to be a component in this, he said, is a survey of the Fathers and what they said say, had to say about Sola Scriptura. That sort of thing. But I want to go to the position of where I am a poor lay believer. Um, the church tells me that the church is the servant of the word, when in fact, what it looks like so often is it acts like prince over it. I ask it questions with regard to particular verses. Should I listen to my individual priest? Is he going to give me the teaching of the magisterium? Do I, when I put my head on my pillow at night, trust that? Um, with tomorrow we're going to deal with this in an even more existential angst. That is, am I saved? And do I listen to my individual priest and simply trust that, put my head on the pillow and hope for the best? Uh, do I look to the scriptures? Can I understand the scriptures? Is it the same to go ask my pastor what the passage means as to ask what the magisterium has said? What do I do? If you're at a church where a pastor is Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday opening the bread of life to you, expositing the text of Scripture in an understandable way such that you hear God's law and God's gospel, such that Christ is the center, not just as a model to copy, but as the dying, atoning Savior of the world, and that his death is enough to save even you with your messy Christian life that week, and the Eucharist is offered, 
listen to what's going on tonight, and I recommend that you stay there. Think about whether the other possibility, that is, the church finally does know, where the poor lay believer, exhausted by the arguments, and I apologize if we've done some of that tonight in a way that obscures things, any of us, especially in the 20th century, are totally wearied and we're on information overload. What you were offered classically by Rome is, we've got the answer to your information overload. Mother understands that you're exhausted. You look exhausted. Come back to the bosom of the church, where the interpretation is always the same and always has been the same. Here I would recommend that you at least do enough study to know that that one is false. In fact, the amount of exegesis of Scripture that Rome's done in its history is not especially overwhelming, just the amount of it. But the invitation is, come home because you're exhausted, back to the bosom of mother. I counsel that you at least buy the tapes or read the books that have been recommended here tonight enough to say, I think before I'm going to do that, I'm going to relook at the Scriptures and I'm going to relook at the central thing proclaimed in the parish I attend or by the church I belong to. And if you've got a little bit of extra energy, read a confessional statement such as, they mentioned the Augsburg Confession, or the Heidelberg Catechism that my friends talk about on the radio, and see if you recognize the text of Scripture and the glory of Christ in them in the way you find in the pages of the Bible. If you go on a trek like that, you will be doing actually what the Protestants recommended in the 16th century. Christ is the center of Scripture. His atoning death for the sins of all men is the center of that. And the Gospel is the news as to how that is given to you. For those of you in the evangelical camp, you'll find much that is in common between your position and what's presented by the brethren here. Sometimes that's shocking to an evangelical, but there are tremendous similarities. You will also find that as you study the the confessions of the churches, that they count some things more central than others. We will, we will do the same things that they do with regard to the classical heresies. There won't be a lot of difference there. We don't like those. But we will talk very much differently when we get to where do you go for the religious information. See if from the scriptures, as you read the Augsburg or the Heidelberg Confession, whether you find that re-said in a way that you can understand. It is amazing to Protestants sometimes when the Bible is called dark and obscure when we have to try and exegete some of what the council said and some of what the papacy has said. This is very difficult for some of us. Now, that doesn't prove that we're right. It could be that we're just too stupid. Hmm? Doesn't prove we're right. But some of us find it difficult. Maybe we need more education, but we find it hard going. And if we go back to John's Gospel, we find it a little easier going. We are not necessarily helped sometimes by the Roman Church's exegesis of passages. Sometimes that doesn't clarify for us. Other people have said that too, and I will nod my head many times and say, is that what that passage is really saying? If you're attending a church where the pastor aids you in that, and he is doing what Paul calls in Galatians, placarding Christ before your eyes, He might be doing more for you, and the Protestants are convinced that he is, than any council that ever met. You can thank them for throwing out the heresies, but there's a lot more they did you probably wouldn't. You'd have to examine for that. But you can can thank them for that. The test for you and me is, do I hear a gospel that is utter rescue when I go to church? Is it rescue to the end? 
Was it done by somebody else for me? And is it enough to save even me, even as a Christian? Ask yourself that when you're at the parish where you worship. If you come to the position that you're just exhausted, there's a church ready and willing to call you back out of your exhaustion. Problems will be solved for you. All you have to do is to fall back to its arms, ready and waiting. Thanks, I'll defer. And now the Catholic rebuttal, ten minutes. I don't know if I have all the little pieces of paper I need with me. I seem to have rather few. I shall try to um, hit the high spots. <clears throat> Let's start with this point about the church where you go and the way in which you should evaluate it. You shouldn't just evaluate the church as to whether you agree with it. Never get the idea that when you were sitting under what claims at least to be a ministry of the Word of God, your taste or your opinion or whether you like it is the right question to be asking. You should be asking rather a different question. And how that question goes, many of you know by painful experience. Many of you have had the problem of leaving the denomination you were raised in because it was taken over by liberalism. Because one or another kind of trendy nonsense replaced the eternal truth of God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever and who saved us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Many of you had to leave a church like that and go to a more conservative denomination. On what basis did you leave the liberal church? Was it because you didn't like it? No. It is because you recognized that what was being preached to you was not what you had always heard. It was not the traditional preaching in your denomination. It was not the proclamation of the Word of God with which you were familiar. It was not the faith once delivered to the saints and you recognized that. Feel free to come back to a church that allows you to make sense of your own experience. You know what it is to experience as traditional what has always been held and to receive the Word of God as tradition. Is the church a prince over the Scripture or a servant? of the scripture it's a good conundrum or it seems to be in fact it is no conundrum at all because it turns upon an ambiguity when you say the scripture do you mean the message or do you mean the text the message is what the scriptures are intended by God to mean. The message is scripture rightly interpreted. To that message, the church is a servant. The text is something else. The text needs to be interpreted. Maybe we got this habit of thinking that some things in Scripture are obscure from our founder, St. Peter. Maybe that's where we got this habit. I don't know. But Peter does say that some things in Scripture are obscure. Things in Paul, as a matter of fact, are hard, difficult to understand, and are twisted by some people. And that saying is in Scripture. It's in 2 Peter 3.16. So the obscurity of parts of Scripture would actually pass the sola scriptura test. That's in the book. As opposed to sola scriptura itself, which is not in the book. Please tell me which it is hmm, 
that is profitable, which it is that thoroughly equips a person unto all good works. What is it that does that? Is it the scripture correctly interpreted? Is it the message that does that? Or is it the text? Surely it is the message that is a light unto our feet. Surely it is the message of God, the true speaking of God, what He really wants us to understand. That's what equips the saints. Please tell me how it is that that simple statement about an entity, which is the message, proves the sufficiency of the text to give you, to interpret itself, to interpret itself, to give you that correct understanding. Much was made of St. Paul in Berea. The Jews there were commended for searching the Scriptures to see if the things St. Paul said were true. This has absolutely nothing to do with tonight's debate. What Paul was doing in Berea, as he did in practically every city he visited, was preach how Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled the Scriptures. Showing that, although this was not commonly seen, in fact, was hardly ever seen, in previous Jewish exegesis. It was in the plan of God that the Messiah should die. That was a great problem to the first preachers of the Gospel. Our Jesus died. The Messiah the Jews were expecting wasn't supposed to die. He was supposed to be a great king and reign gloriously in Jerusalem. Our Jesus not only died, died for our sins, but also rose and chose to reign in heaven, not in Jerusalem. Now that was against the expectations of the day. Paul could point out to them various overlooked psalms. Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And other texts that had been overlooked. And look at what it says in Daniel about the Son of Man coming to be crowned, coming on the sun on the, on the clouds of heaven to be crowned and to receive the kingship so that he would be a king ah, in heaven not on earth after all see that all had to be explained to Jews so of course Paul is telling them to search the Old Testament scriptures those were the only scriptures around they could have searched at that moment so it hardly proves the sufficiency of the scriptures or else it would prove that the Old Testament is sufficient without the New. Then the New Testament would be a fifth wheel. Surely not. Romanists don't have theological unity either. This is a very large and wonderful subject. Okay. Yeah, part of the reason we don't have theological unity but only a very small part of the reason is because we have bad apples in our church who haven't been reproved yet by authority. Every church has bad apples in it according to the parables of our Lord. The neck full of all kinds of fish, some of them worthless and needed to be thrown overboard. When the eschaton comes, there are, yes, 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 we admit, there are weeds in our field. But that only means our field, to that extent at least, resembles the kingdom of God. The real issue of theological unity or disunity is quite different. We do not pretend that the whole counsel of God can be reached by logical, deductive means or application of general principles from those texts which are, or from the content, the from, from what is explicit 
in the clear text of Scripture. Unlike the Westminster Confession, we don't believe that. We think that some of the whole counsel of God is very hard to find in Scripture. It certainly cannot be deduced logically from the points that are clear where the Scripture is clear. Therefore, we do not pretend that we possess the one definitive theology which totally captures the divine message. It may be that our Calvinist friends are, in this regard, more ambitious than we, or, believe, or perhaps less cautious. They may believe that they have precisely this, sole, unique, and complete theology, in which case they can insist on a complete theological uniformity. We can't do that because, frankly, friends, we have long memories. We remember how the Arians argued. We remembered how they picked on the Father is greater than I. And how the Son doesn't know the day or the hour, only the Father, so it seems his ignorance in Christ. We remember how the Arians exploited those verses. Have you ever had a Jehovah's Witness come and bother you? There are Arians today, and they're a pain to deal with. In order to finally silence these people, hmm? At the Council of Nicaea, we had to seize on that formula of one substance, homoousios, of one substance. There is no clear text of Scripture from, that, from which that word or its meaning can be deduced. The homoousios is, the, is an inference to the best interpretation, the best explanation. It's deeply hidden and not simply logically deducible from the clear text. That's why the Arians were hard to refute, harder than some people seem to remember. Thank you very much. Well, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to take the liberty of the moderator and indulge my Episcopal sensibilities and ask the first question myself. And it's addressed to both sides, really, and it's this, what would they say, what would you say, the Protestants and the Catholics, to someone listening tonight who said, I think the first point to concede is that if you quote Scripture itself in order to prove the sufficiency or inerrancy of Scripture, that's going to beg the question. But of course, if you appeal to reason, tradition, or culture to establish the insufficiency of Scripture, that's going to beg the question. But having noted that, and then observed that if I understood correctly, the Protestant side granted that not all truth is in the Bible and that moreover the Bible is not the only form of truth. And yet on the other hand, you have the Catholic side granting that there is, as I, if I heard correctly, a material sufficiency in Scripture, certainly a qualitative sufficiency, if not a quantitative one, that Scripture is an unnormed norm and moreover that the magisterium is subservient to the message. The question my Episcopal soul might ask is, why keep raising the question of sola scriptura? What practically does it get us? If there's this much agreement, why not make a semantic assent and say we're all fallible? Disagreement, in fact, can be useful, as was granted. But finally, there's not a lot of cash value, to use James's phrase, in hashing out yet again sola scriptura. Mike? As Professor Godfrey just said, the, uh, if they will grant that all men are infallible, uh, are, are fallible, that will be acceptable. But uh, I think one of the things we have to realize here is, you know, first of all, the terms of the debate is not, does the Bible teach sola scriptura? What we are doing here is trying to discern from the available evidence whether the Protestant view of, of scripture sufficiency is superior to or inferior to the Roman Catholic view of its authority in the magisterium. Really, the, the question is, which authority is in the final analysis more reliable? What we're saying is that all of us are infallible, 
including our leaders, our highest leaders, fallible. Are, all are all fallible. Sorry. Are, <laughs> see how self authentic Protestantism yes. we're all right. self authentic proposition there. <laughs> no, that's just the TV evangelists who are all right. The uh, we are all fallible, but we are coming to an infallible text. This breeds humility. What it says is that uh, we can all be wrong. We can't all be right. And hopefully you can correct me uh, by your understanding of Scripture. And uh, there's a certain a certain humility there, recognizing that we none of us holds the final uh, interpretation of Scripture. Mike, I, uh, I I think it's appropriate at this point to say that our motive in in discussing sola scriptura is not one to win an argument or to somehow try to prove that one side or the other can amass more clever uh, arguments or, or, or have a better facility with Scripture. The issue, as I see it, and my colleagues would share this, and I, I'm sure all the three of you would share this, the issue at heart here is, what is truth? And how do I know that truth? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. He said the truth will set you free. He made a lot of statements about truth. And I want that truth because I love Jesus Christ, as I know you do. And, and I approach this forum with some fear and trembling because I know I'm dealing with men who are good and godly men. They're not my enemies. They're not my, my, uh, the, the person I'm looking at over the wall with a gun aimed at me. They are my friends as I am their friend. And because I am your friend, and because you're my friend, we want to say to each other, come, let us reason together. Let us look at what God has intended for his church, and let's find it, and let's share it together. As a Catholic, I have studied the, the Protestant arguments. I've looked at the uh, Reformation and the arguments pertaining to Sola Scriptura, and without any disrespect meant to any Protestant at all, I found the arguments wanting scripturally and historically. And it's because of that that I'm offering, as my colleagues are, an alternative, which I believe is plainly seen in scripture, unlike Sola Scriptura. And I'm saying simply, maybe we can't convince you tonight, maybe we can't convince people in this audience tonight, but maybe we can get you to take a second look at it, to rethink it, to be open to the possibility that maybe what we have been told about Sola Scriptura is not in fact true. So that objective desire for truth that we both share, that we all share, is the motive impulse for a debate like this. So to answer your question, the original question, that's why truth counts. And when you're out of truth, you're in a world of hurt. When you're in truth, you're with Christ. And all of us want to be with Christ. Therefore, we say, what is truth? How do we find it? And we start here. Thank you. Let me now turn to questions from the audience, and the first is for the Protestant side. The question reads, practically speaking, how was the Bible alone to serve as the sole rule of faith for the 1500 years between the time of Christ's ascension to the time of the printing press, when Bibles were in very short supply and most people were illiterate? Is this how God would provide for the salvation and grace of his people? Well, first of all, it was preached. Uh, publicly, and people did have the Word of God open to them. Uh, it was uh, sort of the, the uh, community function to go and hear the preaching of the Word of God the way we would go to a movie today. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a drama. Uh, people would also get it in the, pic in the paintings, the frescoes on the walls. Christ was preached to a very large extent in those frescoes, and we believe that when a medieval peasant put uh, his or her head on uh, the pillow at night, and entrusted uh, his or her soul to the safekeeping of Christ, that person was affirming justification by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, sufficiently revealed in Scripture and proclaimed through the church, even though the church was confused. The church didn't actually deny the doctrine of justification until 1564. Now for the Roman Catholic team. It reads, since you are not infallibly protected from error... Why should I believe that you have accurately portrayed the Roman Catholic position, much less what Scripture means or says? Well, why don't you put the question to the other side? Since the professors at 
of Westminster Seminary are not known to be infallible either, but are presenting to you their exegesis of the scriptures, why should you believe what they say is the meaning of the scripture? I mean, it's really a silly question. Human means of erudition always have to be used to get at the meaning of the scripture. In fact, your own Westminster Confession says so. It doesn't say that the clear passages in scripture are so clear that an unlearned person can understand them without doing any work. Okay. It says he has to resort to the ordinary means. That means learning your business, tooling up your mind, working hard. We all agree with that. These are not doctrines that we have dreamed up tonight. These are doctrines that you can find in the catechism of the Catholic Church, that the Catholic Church has believed for 2,000 years. We are just reiterating what we have learned from them. Granted, we are fallible, but we believe the Church is infallible, and that's our source. So it is beside the question of whether we're fallible, we make mistakes all the time. Okay, a question now for the Protestant side. For... Mr. Horton or colleagues, it reads, how would you respond to John Henry Cardinal Newman's insinuation in his Apologia Pro Vita Sua that the doctrine of Sola Scriptura forces the church into this position, quote, there is a right of private judgment, that is, there is no existing authority on earth competent to interfere with the liberty of individuals in reasoning and judging for themselves about the Bible and its contents as they severally please. Well, the Reformation was plagued with Anabaptism. And it was not only uh, so the, the attack on Sola Scriptura not only came from Rome, but from the Anabaptists, which is very interesting because I think uh, Mr. Marshner uh, was uh, using the Anabaptist hermeneutic a moment ago in separating the text from the message. Uh, only at the end of the 20th century would a Roman Catholic be using, via Rudolf Bultmann, the liberal theologian, existentialist theologian, the distinction between kerygma and uh, scripture which is basically a, a carryover from Anabaptism. The Roman Catholic uni- using an Anabaptist hermeneutic is very interesting. Uh, that is, uh, Luther said, to believe that I can open up my Bible, figure out what it means, even if it goes against the teaching of all of my brothers and sisters and the greatest minds of Christendom, is disaster. That means, he said, every man goes to hell in his own way. Martin Luther was not an individualist. John Calvin was not an individualist. That's why they created communities under the word of God and the whole church together submitted to the teaching authority of the church as it interpreted the scriptures. And that's why ministers uh, are bound in the Reformed tradition and the Lutheran tradition to sign statements of faith because they are part of a community which can be corrected under the word of God, but must be corrected in community, not simply by uh, a, uh, a guy watching Jimmy Swagger and figuring out there are 80 gods. I'd like to respond to that, if I may. Sure. Well, I, I think it's, uh, with all due respect, Mike, I think it's rather feel, or, uh, historically short-sighted to uh, maintain that it's the Anabaptists who are to blame for demanding that scripture be interpreted properly. Uh, That is something that the church has always said. If you read the writings of the fathers, as I know you have, you'll know that the great writers of the early church all said essentially the same thing, that scripture is part of the treasury of faith, the deposit of faith that the church has. But scripture's purpose is to be understood properly. And so there's nothing at all unreasonable about saying, look, we know what the text says. I mean, Let's open John chapter 6 if we want an exercise in, in what Bill was talking about. Catholics say that that is referring to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Our Reformed friends would say, no, that's not. And the, the problem lies still on the table. It hasn't been solved yet by the Protestant side. And that is, how do we know for sure what the text means? That's what Bill was getting around to in his remarks. Uh, Vincent of Larens said in his book or his uh, writing the notebooks he said here perhaps someone may ask if the canon of the scriptures be perfect and in itself more than suffices for everything why is it necessary that the authority of ecclesiastical interpretation be joined to it and he answers because quite plainly sacred scripture by reason of its own depth is not accepted by everyone as having one and the same meaning 
He goes on, thus because of so many distortions of such various errors, it is highly necessary that the line of prophetic and apostolic interpretation be directed directed in accord with the norm of the ecclesiastical and Catholic meaning. In the Catholic Church herself, every care must be taken that we hold fast to that which has been believed everywhere, always and by all. For this then is truly and properly Catholic. Yes. yes, sure. Yeah, By we, the way, I think we'll, we'll let this... Know, let's, let's, just who don't, for those who don't know, Vincent of Larens was one of the early church fathers. Okay. I, I Rod, didn't mention that. Yeah, we'll let Rod respond, then we'll get to the next question. The other thing to know here is uh, that, for instance, Chemnitz lists eight kinds of tradition. The Protestant who has a history uh, knows that we up, gave applause to seven out of eight. Uh, we, nobody's arguing here to read this thing, uh, read scripture in an ah historical way. The other thing that's important, I think, is the one I was making mention of earlier. I don't have any hopes of solving the questions of all the birds, dogs, and babies in the Bible. But if I have children, I want to know if they can be saved and how. If I'm getting older, I'd like to know if I could and how. And, uh, on this sort of question, it isn't all of a sudden a bunch of scholars getting together and arguing Hebrew and Greek. The Protestants were saying that the layperson can read the scriptures, understand what sin is, maybe not perfectly, but he'll understand what sin is, who Christ is and why he's here, the text will tell him so, what the cross did, what it is to believe in him, and what it isn't to believe in him. That's, I think, a more limited. Somebody said earlier, uh, I think our view is a little more prosaic. Well, that, ours is prosaic in a fashion, too. Rod, if I may just take your indulgence, I just want to add a footnote to that, man. <laughs> That's caused the whole problem to begin with, indulgences. So I think I'll... <laughs> think I'll... <laughs> Go ahead. A quick addendum. See, see, this simply moves the discussion back one step, but only one step. It, it doesn't solve that. Now, I agree with you. It is important that we know how we're to be saved. That's why we're here on this planet, to be saved. But you, Rod, if I, if I can use you again as, as my piñata for just a moment, um, you as a Lutheran believe that baptism is a means of God's grace. And that for the baptized person, we could take an infant as an example, that person is regenerated and justified and endowed with God's grace. That is central to the issue of salvation. What if that child dies with or without baptism? Now, Bob denies that vociferously. My question is this. You simply have not answered the question by going by the Bible alone. Both of you come up with diametrical positions. How do you solve that problem? That's the problem of Sola Scriptura. We try to solve it by studying the Scripture together, yeah. because it's the only way the problem can be solved. And whose opinion do you ultimately say, this is the one that I follow? And if you, you've already admitted that, you're in, that you are fallible, then how can you say, this is for sure the right interpretation? I can't say this is for sure the right interpretation. Well, why I have to say follow? that I try in every way possible to submit my mind to the Scripture and to remain in consultation with the brethren as to what the Scripture is, is saying. Uh, there's no way out of this world with its problems and its dilemmas, and it's a romantic notion that the Pope can take us out of this world because he hasn't taken the Roman Church out of this world. Okay, let me let me now interject another. I think we've exhausted that one. Now let me let me uh, get another question for us from the audience. This is for the Roman Catholic side. How is the doctrine of Mary as mediatrix of all graces because of intercession for us in heaven? explicitly or implicitly contained in scripture I have to admit I could you repeat it I, I missed the latter part of the question I'm sorry how is the doctrine of Mary as mediatrix of all graces because of her intercession for us in heaven explicitly or implicitly contained in scripture we never said it was it's not a defined dogma there were a bunch of people around in the late 50s who wanted that mediatrix business universal mediatrix of grace business defined as a dogma it was never done a sufficient number of theologians thought that there that that could not be found even you know implicitly 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 uh, uh, in scripture so that one is still sitting around I mean we uh, um, 
various propositions remain in the lumberyard of theology for a long time, shall we say, but they never get defined unless we think there's a case to be made for them. Perhaps you could come up with another example. It might have been a better question. But while I have the floor, <laughs> let me suggest a way beyond impasse on whether or not we need to baptize our babies. It isn't that the Pope is going to just automatically solve this for us. The point is, the Pope inculcates a way of getting at answers that moves us a step beyond the impasse of the exegetes. You look at the practice of the first, the second, the third, the fourth century. There's a wonderful book, by the way, on infant baptism by Joachim Jeremias, Protestant, I mean, a Lutheran exegete, as a matter of fact, it's a terrific book. And Jeremias, although I guess he's a sola scriptura man in some sense, pays very careful attention to the early practices of the church and looks at the Christian sarcophagi for young children and looks at the words of the fathers urging people to baptize their children and so on so that you get a broader pool of evidence so that you are looking at scripture in its context. Namely, the original practice of the church as it was established by the apostles and was receiving this scripture. Mr. Moderator, could I respond just very briefly? Sure. The new catechism of the Catholic Church on page 252 of this particular edition put out by a Catholic press uh, says, therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church under the titles of advocate, helper, benefactress, and mediatrix. Now, Mr. Marshner has just illustrated the problem that the reformers have. Tradition says she is mediatrix. The catechism says she is mediatrix. But when we say this contradicts the scripture, we're told by Mr. Marshner that that's not official dogma of the Roman Church. So which is the official dogma of the Roman Church? <laughs> Mr. Horton uh, found this selection for me. I don't know this catechism that well. Uh, it's, it's a very big catechism. The Heidelberg is much easier to read and understand. Uh, <laughs> But we come back to the point never addressed by our, our, our opponents. What is this tradition that is necessary to salvation? We don't know. And Rome never makes it clear. No, Rome makes it clear ever and anon. And usually to the discontentment of people who have been trying to innovate and bring in new doctrine. We've been making it clear ever since our churches were overrun by an infestation of the Gnostics. What that catechism is talking about is general foundation for the uses of these titles in piety and devotion, right? That's quite different from declaring a dogma. And as far as the, you know, the reason to go into uh, the, um, the, the, re the way in which all the Marian dogmas are implicit in Scripture can be said very shortly. can be said very shortly if you insist upon hearing it. It can be said that when Gabriel appears to the Blessed Virgin and tells her that she is to become the mother of one who will take the throne of his father David forever. It's clear from the very structure of that story that it is a call narrative. It's not just bringing information. It's calling to accept a position. Now, if you're told that your son is going to be the king, what's your position? That you're going to be the queen mother. That's the position you're being called to. Queen Mother is an important office in the monarchy of Israel in the Old Testament, isn't it? Now, when we find out that this king is going to be a Messiah, then the job description becomes very interesting. When we find out that this Messiah is going to maintain a spiritual kingdom, then the role of the Queen Mother is not going to be a political role, but a spiritual role. So there are a great many truths about the Blessed Virgin, which can be found implicit in there and in Christ's title as the new Adam and so on. But that really isn't what we came to debate here tonight. If anybody wants to get into the whole nine yards of Mariology, bring us back. We'll do three hours and maybe we can begin to do justice. Okay. Thank you. Time is, is winding down. The next question from the audience that I would have read is, are there any traditions on either side, if adhered to, that are damnable? Name them. But I think we'll let that one go tonight. Uh, 
And I'll invite now both sides to give their wrap-up five minutes. First, the Protestant side. Well, we have demonstrated that we, too, believe in the infallibility of tradition. If by that one is referring to the traditions of the apostles before they were inscripturated. Scripture does refer to tradition, but it is a paratheke, a deposit, 1 Timothy 6.20 and 2 Timothy 1.14. Not an evolving post-apostolic revelatory process. Jude speaks of contending for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to the saints. The purpose of tradition after the apostles is not to reveal new truths, but to illumine, defend, and confess that which is already revealed. That's why the early councils appeal to the authority of Christ, the prophets, and the apostles, rather than regarding, regarding their own authority as sufficient for such declarations. We have shown not only that Scripture does teach the sufficiency of Scripture, we have demonstrated that the church fathers affirmed it, we have shown that councils and popes have erred, and even contradicted and condemned each other as apostates. Popes have been deposed and even judged, judged as heretical by other popes so that in two centuries, one third of Europe was under the excommunication, which means if you die in mortal sin, you will go to hell. I assume that none of our opponents this evening would say the Bible is contradictory, and yet they simply cannot ignore the obvious contradictions in the magisterial tradition of the church. If the Bible can't be shown conclusively to contain contradictions, but the magisterium can, which is the more reliable guide? In other words, why shouldn't I listen to the voice of Scripture, as dull as my hearing might be, when it is contradicted by tradition, if scripture has been shown to be more reliable than contradictory counsels and popes. Furthermore, the Roman notion of an infallible interpreter of scripture rests on the assumption that the Bible is an unclear book. And yet, isn't the problem really that the Bible is all too clear, where Rome's traditions are called into judgment? It hardly requires a team of scholars working round the clock to figure out that there is only one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2.5, contradicts boldly the assertion of Rome in the New Catechism that Mary is mediatrix. When Scripture and the Church agreed, all was fine, but what happens when there is a variance? For instance, when the Church declares that celibacy is a more spiritual estate than marriage, while St. Paul explicitly calls those who enforce celibacy demonic spirits in 1 Corinthians. The most obscure and tortuous arguments are employed in order to make it appear as if the church is not contradicting the clear voice of scripture. The obscurity, therefore, lies not in the biblical text, but in the church's own distortions. Therefore, I ask you, is the teacher to be more obscure than what she is teaching? That is not to say, as we have argued, that all scripture is equally clear. The Westminster Confession notes all things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation, which has brought us all here, even though we do disagree on certain positions, but I might add not as vociferously as Ron or Schilebex, Ratzinger, and others in the Roman Church would disagree with each other this very night. Peter recognized that some things in Paul's writings were difficult, but not in themselves, they were difficult, says Peter, because the unstable and untaught distort them. Further, Paul assures believers, we do not write you anything you cannot read or understand. 2 Corinthians 1.13 Surely the scriptures come closer to this goal of clarity than does the magisterium. So why should the teacher be more difficult to understand in the subject that is taught? We are reminded of C.S. Lewis's remark that it's much easier to read Plato than a modern book explaining Plato to us. The church has never been preserved from divisions, even during the apostolic era. As we have seen, there were even, uh, if there were an infallible magisterium, surely it was then when the apostles were breathing, and yet divisions occurred. Divisions occurred throughout church history, the greatest being the East-West schism in the 11th century. The other schisms that we've been talking about as well. 
We are fallen, and that includes the highest leaders in Christendom. We can fail not only morally and doctrinally, and this is why every Christian armed with scripture must be allowed to call into question the greatest authority in the church, as Paul commended the Bereans. Finally, among the many logical fallacies our friends have employed tonight, they have argued in a circular fashion for an infallible teaching office. In order to correctly interpret the infallible scriptures, we need an infallible interpreter. But how do we know that the Pope and the councils are infallible? Here they turn to the scriptures in vain for their arguments. But if the scriptures alone are sufficient to convince us of an infallible teaching office, have they not subverted their own argument? Stewing either the tyranny and contradictions of magisterial infallibility on one hand, or the sectarianism of private interpretation which dominates evangelicalism on the other, the Protestant reformers insisted that the church did have a teaching office, and the councils were not to be automatically rejected, but affirmed wherein they agreed with scripture. Calvin observed, when this, sola scriptura, is our approach, the councils would retain all the majesty which is due to them, while at the same time scriptures would hold the preeminence so that everything would be subject to its standard. To sum it all up, at the end of the day, this matter is of utmost practical relevance. Some of you might be saying, I came here tonight to gain clarity. I've heard a lot of theological mumbo jumbo on both sides, leading me to wonder whether this whole business is so convoluted I might as well chuck the whole thing. Let me speak very briefly in closing to you. For those of you who wonder whether you can go home tonight, open up your Bible and find Christ, we on the Protestant side have been arguing that you can. You can understand the Bible. It does make sense. You don't have to have a theological education. But you cannot interpret it by yourself outside of the Christian community. Nor can you escape the teaching office of the church, which is itself subject to scripture. The question, how can I, a sinner, be right with God, is answered so clearly and simply that a child could understand it, although it is foolishness to those who are perishing. That's our point. It's no wonder that Rome teaches the dogma of implicit faith. That is, believe it because the church tells you to. How else could an average layperson possibly hope to understand the hundreds of contradictory and convoluted papal and conciliar de declarations of the last 300 years? One would have to simply take the expert's word for it, as we do in so many areas of our life today. That's not what a good teacher does. Especially if the scriptures were in the very beginning addressed to lay people in their own common everyday language to save them from their sins, to give them hope in their desperate lives. But we're arguing that the scriptures are so clear that a fisherman can become an apostle. The church is a good teacher. If she, like our Lord himself with his disciples on the Emmaus Road, will open up the scriptures to show you Christ on every page. For through the written word, we come into vital communion with the living word, who will not leave his children orphans. And now, the, the Roman Catholic summary, concluding remarks. Yes, he will not leave us orphans. But I would consider myself an orphan if I could not answer the question whether I baptize infants or not. What do we do in the meantime when we're trying to figure out what that scripture is trying to say to us? Where are all these babies going? Yes, of course, we may say they're in, the, in God's will and God's going to figure out what to do with them himself. That goes without saying. But is that the kind of church that Jesus left us? For 20 centuries now, we're groping to find out whether baptismal regeneration is true or false? Is that the kind of church that he gave us? I thought the scripture said that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 The church for the first three centuries had no problem. Baptismal regeneration for infants. That's why they were baptized. Now all of a sudden we have a problem with that. And we're in, excuse the expression, limbo, trying to decide out where these babies are going. I asked Dr. Godfrey for a verse other than 2 Timothy 3.16 that taught Sola Scriptura. He gave me Deuteronomy 31. In the Old Testament, no less. 
Now, if that's the strongest verse that he can point to, to teach Sola Scriptura, I think that doctrine is in a lot of trouble. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. You know, if what is said by, of the Protestants to the Catholics, that they departed from the faith just a mere century or two or three after the deposit of faith was given, boy, you know, we're in worse shape than the Jews ever were. At least they lasted a few hundred years without going astray. But here, the mystery is revealed. Jesus comes and gives us the truth, and we're told that we departed from the faith a mere century or two after this has, deposit has been made. How can that be? We have not heard an answer to the question in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 where Paul specifically tells Timothy to hold on to orally inspired teaching, to keep it, to guard it, to pass it on to reliable men. Where has that been taken away? Nowhere. In Acts chapter 20, Paul says to the Ephesians, I have given you the whole counsel of God. In the Ephesian epistle, we have short chapters, six chapters. Is that the whole counsel of God? Did not Paul tell them much more about their faith than the mere six chapters in Ephesians? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, that I have given you these instructions, or 1134 rather, I have given you the instructions on the Lord's Supper, and when I come, I will tell you even more. In Ephesians 3, 3, he says, I taught you some things and I've written about them briefly, which means he told them much more than what he had written down in the Ephesian epistle. And he told Timothy to guard that, to guard it. Why? Because that tradition held the interpretation of those very scriptures that Paul was giving and more. My opponent tonight has not explained why Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16 says the scripture is profitable not sufficient. If I were Paul and I were teaching a doctrine of Sola Scriptura, I would use the strongest word I could find. But he doesn't. He doesn't even come close. You know, when I think about Martin Luther, and it is comical, the verse that was quoted tonight, that I will have it my way, basically, is what Martin Luther said. And if they don't like my interpretation, I'll throw Jimmy into the stove. Now, is that the way we arrive at truth? Here, the theology of a man has presumed itself over the canon of Scripture. And that started the whole mess, folks. That blunder, that audacious blunder... (coughs) That has no room in the truth of God. For 16 centuries, the church believed the same doctrines until another man came along and said, I'm sorry, folks, you may have thought you'd been led into truth by the Holy Spirit, but you've had it wrong for 16 centuries. You don't even know how to be saved. Is that the church Jesus came to establish? Is that the truth that he was going to lead us into? I beg to say not. The sufficiency of Scripture? I don't know where the Bible teaches the sufficiency of Scripture. Yes, it's perfect. It's complete. Qualitatively. But where, and I ask this pointed question, where does the Bible teach a quantitative sufficiency of Scripture? It does not.